do this thing called jazz hands. We do this. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if you would like to join us in the, j the jazz hands. There you go. Just gets us psyched up, gets us excited. <laughs> we are live. We are live. <laughs> I hope you got your big girl panties on. We've got Robert Fax on. Or do you prefer Bob? Either one's good, right? I don't know. Can you hear me? Can. No, okay, there you go. Yes, we've got. I was saying we've got Robert Faxon from Faxon Firearms. Uh, do you prefer Bob? Bob. Bob's Bob. great. There you go. So there we go. We've got Bob Faxon live on the show with us for for the next two hours. We'll be answering questions, talking about all kinds of stuff. Obviously, showing guns. I've got some things here. If you look behind Bob, he's got some stuff over there. He's got more stuff than I have. And uh, it looks pretty awesome. So usually what I do here, Bob, is the, the first thing I do is uh, remind people that we're live from the Big Daddy Gun Studios. This is the Who Move My Freedom podcast. I believe this is episode 94. There episode you go. Just came back. Yeah, episode 94 <clears throat> tonight. Are you having some problems? If you're having problems with the audio thing, you can unplug that headset. It's probably better. It, it, it just freezes once in a while. Oh, it does? Okay, yeah, maybe your yeah. signal. Uh, if you go up to the top of the screen, do you have something to adjust your bandwidth usage? I don't know. You're not, no. I know you're not, you're not a super... I, I think if I touch this thing, we'll probably be done. Yeah, tonight. You're, not, yeah you're not the IT guy. We'll work it out. We'll figure it out. <laughs> All right, if, if I hesitate for a minute, you know why. Yeah, absolutely, which is fine, which is fine. And if we... I snore, you know what's going on. So oh, if you way, snore. You know. <laughs> if you snore, we are really in trouble. <laughs> so there you go, you know, and, and what I do here on the top of the show, I want to remind everyone to click the thumbs up. Please click those thumbs up. We really need you to uh, like this video. You know, if you don't like us, you can click the thumbs down too, but we prefer the thumbs ups. You know, obviously share this, share with your family and friends on social media that we're here doing this. I invite everyone in the chat to please click those thumbs up. We need to get this going. This is a very, very special show tonight. You know, we've never had Robert Faxon or Faxon on the show. So we want to, you know, we want to show them a good time. I'm going to go here in the chat and shout out all the folks who are in here. Here we have a lot of people in here. Looks like Tango Hunter was number one tonight. And then the Tyvin Show. Uh, let's see. Shut up and play your guitar. Mike Brown. What's up, guys? Greg 98K, The Archangel, Lost in Outdoors. Shout out to you, Chris Bullis. What's going on? Let's see who else is in here. 50 Stitches Steel is joining us tonight. What's up, 50 Stitches? Uh, let's see who else we have here so far hanging out with us in the chat. Uh, Chris B, uh, Gorillas and Guns. What's up? Uh, let me see. I'm trying to scroll down here. You guys have been hanging out in the chat for a long time, so there's a bunch of uh, chat going on. Vanessa Kitty, Brian Quick, shout out to you guys. And uh, LB Louis Cipher is also joining us. And let's see who else is in here. Scott Kimball, Scott1911, lots of Scots, Little Lioness, Vlarisha, David G., Rod Mills, what's up, Rod Mills? So lots of people. If I missed you, you know, it's just me here so far. Uh, Lola's not in here yet, and it's just going to be Bob and I talking for the two hours tonight. And uh, we're going to try to cover as much stuff as we can in the time that we have given. And uh, Lola actually left me instructions, Bob. So the first thing she wanted me to ask you was about the company and how you got Facts on Firearms started. What can you tell us about that? All right. Um it's kind of exciting because just a little side note, Facts and Machining, which is the real company that started it all, is going to celebrate 40 years January of wow. next year. So 40 years, we've been playing around cutting metal. And several years ago, about five or six, we decided we want to try to make a product. We do a lot of machining for various industries. And all of a sudden, we came up with making firearms. And because there were so many highly competent people making a standard AR-15, we kind of put it off for a little bit and said, you know, there's no way we can catch up with those people. But what happened is we were watching a discovery show with my boys. I was, and we watched the top 10 all time battle rifles. And number two was the AR and number one was the AK. So we do a little bit of defense work and, and, and there's never a time we get into a room and have engineers saying, let's make the second best anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and drew up what we call the a rack, which is a combination of an AR 15 and an AK 47 by features and functions and operating systems. So we, we sketched that up. It took about a year, year and a half to get it made ready to go to market. And then we started out with the ARAC 21 about five years ago. 
And that was our way to get into the market because it was different, truly different. And we still uh, find a very loyal marketplace for that rifle. And then when we started making barrels, we figured out that in the AR market, that's really where the volume is. So we started switching over and started accommodating the AR-15, AR-10 platforms. And then we went into various barrels, various components, hand guards, bolt carriers, uppers, lowers, et cetera. And then we went into the uh, AR-10. So we started using the barrel size for 308s and the Creedmoors. And uh, then we got into the pistols now. So because of our manufacturing background, we have about 165,000 square feet. And we've been doing this for a very long time. So we said, hey, let's just keep expanding the product line. Making metal parts is really our background. So it was very natural to design and try to make hopefully a little better product by some twist or variation. Hopefully everything we do has something to it that would make our product a little bit different. Right. I hope to say better, but I'm not saying that across the board because a lot of times preference is a big component of product. So mm -hmm. I don't think you never mandate that mine is better or worse. You just want to supply something to the consumer that maybe has a different twist to it or a little bit of variation that maybe they would like to have. So yeah. <clears throat> that's how we started about five years ago. And it's, I guess it's been about three years now that we've been pretty, pretty aggressive in the marketplace and growing. And the company's grown from really – one part-time guy on a wooden bench to about 40 employees and about, eh, they probably got 40,000 square feet out there that is consumed with firearm components. Yeah, there's a lot of this. I think in the last year, you guys have had a lot of expansion. I know there's new people that have come on the team. You've really uh, professionalized it, right? <laughs> well, you, you know, I'll tell you, Hank, there's, there's so many things to business and life. Whatever. I will say this, and you probably heard it, but I'm a huge advocate that everything boils around people. And uh, centers around people. People are key to everything. Uh, our relationship here, our, our friendship over the years mm -hmm. to, to produce this podcast, our opportunity to understand customers, our engineers' ability to produce those products. It really is teamwork and people that make a difference. It, it's, it's, there's no one thing or one person. And I'm glad you said that because as we've expanded and grown in the last several years, one of the things that you always fear is to lose your service that mm -hmm. you grow and you can't call people back or you don't do a good job anymore, your quality drops. And I think our focus has been on supporting structure of the company and not letting it topple because it, it became successful and then failed. Mm -hmm. we, we want to definitely avoid that. So our, our focus is on matching the growth of the company that you would never see along with the growth of quote unquote sales and products so that we can continue the same level of support and, and development because developing new products and, and improving what we have is a absolute core issue for our company that, that, that is, that is ingrained in us. It's never good enough and we never have the right things. So we continually strive. Yeah. I, I think the thing I, you know, that people appreciate the most about facts on is what you said earlier that you guys are trying to do something different. I mean, you're not necessarily completely reinventing the wheel, but there's lots of things out there that, that folks are interested in getting their hands on that they would like to have. And most companies just want to keep going with the tried and true stuff. And I think that there's a little bit of, uh, I don't know what's the best way to put it. I think there's like some boredom or, you know, there's this thing where like, okay, everyone's making an AR and, you know, and folks want to see something different out there so that it's exciting to build things again and their imaginations get going. I know that um, that's really like for you, that's the big thing, right? You're you like to imagine stuff that you would like to exist as well. well that, that's you know, that's a great point, Hank, because what, what's funny is they, they say I'm, a, I'm the company's biggest critic and the biggest consumer. So mm -hmm. I like to take things and shoot them and test them and experience them as what we like to refer to as a customer's experience. In other words, when you buy a product from us, you're right. A barrel is a barrel. It's a cylinder with some rifling and a bullet should come out the other end. But right. when you go a little further than that, one of the things that's interesting, there are very high quality products. There are very inexpensive products. And if you hit a match of quality and value, and, and I refuse to discuss or, or entertain any low quality aspect of anything that we sell that's off the table but when you match quality with cost and you provide a, a high value and we have our standard barrels and now we have our match grade barrels and our match grade barrels are 5r and they have coated extensions in there the polished crowns they are a better product but mm -hmm. what we're still trying to do at every level of expectation provide value our customer is not the guy who wants to brag about how much he spent on something that really doesn't shoot that well yeah. Our customer says, I would buy another one tomorrow. 
that, that I, I'm very happy with the money I spent and the product I got. That That's our goal as a company. So even though everything is out there, quality, inexpensive, expensive, et cetera, these variables are out there. What we're trying to do is match that right mixture for the customer that he's a very satisfied, he or she is a very satisfied customer. Right. Absolutely. I think that's a good thing. That's, you know, that's how you move everything forward. Um, you know, and the, that goes in line with the first thing that you guys offered, the ARAC 21, right, which you, which you were describing in the beginning, basically mm -hmm. a hybrid of, um, you know, of an AK and an AR. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you came, because it's been, it's been a while now, when you came out with that, did you originally just come out with 762 or 556? We had the 556 and the 762, and we brought the 300 black out later. Okay. So we have all three calibers now, but the 762 and the 556, if you remember back what I said, the original genesis of the ARAC was mm -hmm. the AR-15 and the AK-47. And, and, and the, the thing that's odd to me is I don't think anybody could rightfully say that neither rifle has anything good to offer. Both do. Both have very mm -hmm. strong arguments. That's why you have uh, people who are strong in the camp of the AK and strong in the camp of the AR. So yeah. the problem I think that, that I saw was everybody becomes so polarized that you either want Ford or Chevy, right? You're either a Chevy guy or you're a Ford guy. But if Ford had a good engine and Chevy had a good transmission, well, I would want a chord. Yeah. I would want the <laughs> transmission and the engine put together. So right. I would want the best product. I wouldn't want to polarize and say either or. I would say best of both. Mm -hmm. So the ARAC was truly a combination of saying, look, you can't discount some of the componentry, the reliability, the folding stock, the, the variations, the long stroke gas piston that the AK-47 offers. And the caliber of the bullet is one of those entities. There are people who would discount an AR just for the grain size or the diameter of a bullet. Mm -hmm. So to capture both markets, initially we had to have the 7.62 by 39 round to go with the 5.56 because the idea was that the ARAC could create a platform. And basically, it's a monolithic billet machined aluminum upper, and it will fit on any AR-15. So the idea was you could build this and customize it with the barrel either long or short or precision or close quarter. You could put a sniper stock on it. You could put a folding stock on it and shoot with the folded stock for vehicles, different type mm -hmm. applications. So what we wanted was a very universal platform. And now you can customize that with optics. You've got a 15-inch Monet, unitary picatinny on top that is directly correlated to the barrel at two points, 10 and a half inches apart. So you've got a platform. You can change barrels, change optics, change stocks, formats, et cetera, and reach a multiple uh, number of uses for that rifle or that platform. And, and that was the thing we weren't, I think it's really important when a company comes on that doesn't say, Hey, I made something and it's the best and you should buy that because it's great. It, it fit, it's the best for everybody. That just doesn't exist. So what you try to do is say, what are people out there, what do they need, whether they're a professional mm -hmm. law enforcement, even a military, or even a, a, just a, a three-gun shooter, a, a competitive shooter, or a sports shooter? If you look at it and you say, stop telling them what they want, what they need, and start asking them what they want. And the people will come back with various numbers of demands or requests. And to make a platform that is flexible, instead of trying to drive one thing down one lane and say, this is, this is the all it, right. uh, is to say look, you want lighter, shorter, longer, better calibers, whatever. And, and that was the whole, whole idea of making an ARAC platform. So you can meet many needs with a consistent product. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that, that um, I know that a lot of people liked about it is the side charging, right? You know, mm -hmm. Forward yeah. side charging handle? Yeah. People, people want things like that. I think a lot of companies are reticent to get into that. I'm not really sure why. Maybe they want to stick to what's mil spec or they're building guns for the, you know, for guys that are in the army and this is what they use. But for those of us who never went into the army and we're just thinking about what would be most convenient for us or easier to use for us. You know, we, we like having things like that. Now, I remember when the ARAC first came out, it was a little bit heavy. I know that was the first iteration. And then the next thing you guys, like the next evolution of it was you made it lighter, right? You changed the barrel. So we came out with a lighter weight barrel. We, we, we designed it for when, when you design something, I think it's important that you set your requirements first. When you're building something, you, you don't want to build it in a zigzag pattern. You want to have a very specific list of expectation requirements. So there were four feet, four driving entities for the ARAC. Number one was reliability. Number two was features or capabilities of the, of the platform. Third was accuracy, believe it or not, because a battle rifle wasn't trying to compete with a bolt action. And fourth was price. So 
The price being the lowest is why you see billet and bar for all the components. Everything is made okay. from solid billet or bar. So cost was the lowest factor in it, to be honest. The reliability was based on the fact that the barrel is held in two places instead of one. It doesn't, it's not a free floating, but it's as accurate. And we can, we can, we can, in our testing, we feel the ABAC is equal to or greater than a free floating barrel. So we've done enough testing to be very firm in that statement. But what it does do, there'll be no movement of the barrel to the optics platform as a free floating can. Um, and and that, that's one of the features that we think is, is kind of cool. It's a very durable, uh, robust platform. It is not by any stretch the lightest rifle out there. It is probably, you know, in the eight pound range, seven and a half, eight pound range. And now to accommodate those folks, because of the geometries, we had to come up with an AR platform that was a, an ultralight. So one of our new products that we'll have at SHOT Show is an ultralight rifle. It's a five, 4.93 pounds. Really? And uh, it's a, it's a full size, full length pencil barrel. Well, I say it's 14 and a half inch with a pin welded muzzle brake or flash hider okay. that is only 620 diameter. And that allows you to buy a barrel or to take a gun and put the gas block in the barrel, not over and build it. But the rifle that we put together uses a carbon fiber handguard, and this is one of them here. It's a uh, very, very lightweight carbon fiber handguard with an ultralight bolt carrier group and an adjustable gas block. Pros and cons. Um, these guns would be for a shooter who is more in tune with really managing his weapon as far as tuning it, if he uses different ammunition, et cetera. But mm -hmm. if you are like a three gun or you're a competitive shooter and you're going to shoot consistent ammunition, you can tune this rifle by dropping the gas with a low mass bolt carrier and have an incredibly low recoil. It is a very, very sweet shooting rifle. Now the drawback in a truck gun, if you threw this thing in the truck and somebody threw you a magazine of ammunition, a two, two, three may not, may not, cycle if you're tuned to 5.56. Five, so there'll be some sensitivity to a gun like that. Right. But if you have general purpose, probably use a standard bolt carry, go a little heavier and call it a day and you'll shoot anything that fits in it. But if you want a very tuned weapon with a lightweight and a super low recoil, our ultralight is probably the answer. So when you can't drive the A-rack into a lane it doesn't belong, gears. And right. so we went with the ultralight and the AR platform. It's a much better, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong. It's like chocolate and vanilla ice cream. Both of them are good. You just have a choice. Yeah. If you're going to take this thing for durability, longevity, the fact that the bolt carrier rides on hardened steel rails in an A-rack, that it does not need lubrication to function. If you were in a desperate situation, this gun might be a more reliable option because of its mechanics. And the AR is obviously a proven platform. It's a blast. I mean, it's fun to shoot. And if you want to go for sheer weight and just, just holding it on target, an ultralight tuned with the right ammunition is an incredibly fun rifle to shoot. Mm -hmm. The first the first time I took one out, we had all the components. We had the ultralights. We had the carbon fibers and gas blocks and the barrels. We had all these things. <clears throat> and I said, you know, I, I want to take this thing out. I, I want to put a gun together with all these pieces. Let's see how they function together. We'd done them all individually. We tested everything. I said, did we ever really put all these together into one rifle? They said, I don't know if we really did. I said, I want to build one. So we built a carbon fiber, low mass, 14 half pin welded pencil. We put the whole thing together. Weighed it up. So, wow, that's pretty cool. It's under five pounds. But the most exciting part, Hank, is when we went out and shot the thing. Mm -hmm. And I speak specifically for the three-stage small diameter muzzle brake that's on that rifle. It is phenomenal as far as the fun. So, I always take my A-Racks and I shoot rounds. Every time I go to the range, I pump rounds through A-Racks just for round counts and durability. And normally, I'll buy a 70 80% I'll shoot through an A-Rack and 20 30% I'll shoot through an AR for whatever I'm testing or using. And in this particular instance, I took this stupid lightweight AR out and mm -hmm. I kept picking it back up and mm -hmm. I kept shooting it. And I, I didn't pick up my A-Rack. I felt like I was cheating on a girlfriend. Yeah. My A-Rack only shot about 20% of the ammo. So right. I really, really found a soft spot for a really well-tuned, lightweight, low-recoil AR. But yeah, it I is think a lots lot of, of people shooting. want that. I think lots of folks are uh, looking for that. And they're looking for it to fit different purposes. I think some guys want to do that for competition purposes. Some some folks want to have something lightweight, maybe that they can uh, fold away, pack away into a backpack or something like that. Or, you know, if you have to get out there and walk, you, you want to reduce the amount of weight that you're carrying because you obviously won't be able to carry everything. Did the did the development of the ARAC lead to the pencil barrel or did you guys already have a pencil barrel going in? No, because the nature of the ARAC was to be robust and heavy. The pencil barrel wasn't a priority. It was more robust, heat, large barrels, heavy diameter, you know, all that was the ARAC platform was that kind of a, a, an MO. So the AR deal 
when we went in the yard, just like you said, everybody makes everything. It's really hard to come up with something truly unique. But one of the things that you can do is get high performance out of lightweight. And there is a market for people who want that weight aspect. So the ultralight barrels, the ultralight carriers, those were the things that kind of popped up that said people were looking for. So it's not that we're the first one to do it. We take no claim for that. What we tried to do was do it very well and be very competitive for weight and performance. Yeah, because I think you guys are now like the go-to for pencil barrels, right? I mean, I that's know, cool. That, that's yeah, that's really the good. way I look at it. We've got, uh, I mean, you know, it's like a shameless plug here. But if the <laughs> folks, if the folks are looking, and first of all, let me remind folks, we've got lots of people actually watching the show, and uh, there's a bunch of questions. Lola's here now, so she's going to go through the questions, and I'll take some. But I just want to remind you guys, click the thumbs up. We really uh, need that and appreciate it, as well as share this, um, that we're doing this with your friends and family on social media so other folks can jump on here and ask us questions. And what I was going to is Lola built this lightweight gun. So this entire gun, that you, and she really did build this. There's a video up of it. And um, she built it up herself and shot it and everything using the Kaiser US upper and lower. So that's a polymer upper and lower. Uh, involved here and um, to, to help keep it lightweight she went with the uh, Faxon mid-length pencil barrel man it's really awesome this whole it's entire great, gun as you see it here is less than six pounds so and now Lola is one of those people that's spoiled because if she picks up anything else that's heavier she's like why is this gun so heavy I'm like okay because <laughs> that's how guns used to be <laughs> you know uh, now, we, now we don't expect that. But, you know, the reason why I'm showing you guys this is because when we were building this, I was like, yeah, we have to get a pencil barrel from Faxon. So, you know, I think that's a good thing. And, it, and that's why I was asking you if the, you know, with the ARAC 21, did that come first or did the pencil barrel come first? And I think you said that you did the ARAC and then out of that you developed a pencil barrel. And, and then is this a leading seller for you guys? I'm going to assume it is. Yeah, the, the pencil barrels in the Gunner series are very popular. The new Match series are very popular. And 9 millimeters, we, we have a full line of 9 millimeter barrels, are very popular. Yeah. I, think, okay. I think one of the things that you see is you see kind of a rotation in the marketplace. Right. You'll see where 308s will be popular, and then 9 millimeters might become popular, or high precision match grade may become popular. It could switch over to a ultra light. And, and all of them sell all the time. And you'll see the volumes fluctuate. And I don't know if it's really seasonal or just, just the way the marketplace moves. One of the things the company, you know, the firearms companies have to do is be adaptive and be responsive. And I think that when the customers start asking for things, we try very hard to provide that. So we can switch our manufacturing production fairly quickly because we make everything. So we can make what the customer wants when they want it. And, and hopefully with our lead times internally, we can min minimize the out-of-stock times so we can yeah. get product on the shelf. Okay, yeah, that's that's a, a great thing to be able to do. What so what's popular right now? Right now is well, the pistol barrels just came out, and so that has a pretty much kind of a pent yeah, up. So that would be these, right? Things. We're talking about these. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. And and uh, yeah, go ahead. Which, oh, you've got green there. Very nice. Well, funny story. I'll hold this up. I don't know if you can see this or not. Is that green? You yeah, see is the that difference? the multi? Yeah. This is a multicolor, and yeah. you can kind of see some of the blue and purples in yes. there. Yes. Right. Well, here, here's what's really weird. We, we call this a chameleon. And there are no two of these the same. This coating is deposited line of sight, and it's various uh, elements that provide this coating. And there's two things. First of all, I want to I tell you the, the major issue I told you, quality is always the driver. All of these PVD coatings are line of sight. So they're putting a chamber and things deposit. They will not go inside of a bore. So on our barrels, whether they're stainless or they're steel, one thing we do is we QPQ nitrite 100% of all of our barrels. That gets the chamber hardened, gives it the rust and corrosion prevention, et cetera, and the barrel liner. Then mm -hmm. we do a little process on the outside and do the PV decoding. So okay. it's kind of like an M&M. You get the candy colored outside, but you get the good hard inside. Oh, okay. So and then you and then you, you put a clear coat. Uh, is that a, a clear kind of coating that goes over whatever? Nope. This is no, the PVD. Okay. This is the actual oh. PVD. So okay. you, have, you have various colors. There's the burnt bronze. There's the there's black, of course, which is the QPQ nitrite. And then you have the right. PVD coatings. Yes. And I think and there's a couple got, more. You got a gold one. See, look. A gold one. Gold. Yeah. As a matter of fact, yeah. I've I've got there some of them. Gold. I like gold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And here's here's one of our. <laughs> 
so you can kind of see there. Yeah, I mean, I like, honestly, my favorite one, the gold one looks great when you're doing videos, but my favorite one is the, this is like a, a matte black one. And you can't really see mm -hmm. that that well in anything, but that's what I like. I like the, you know, understated matte finish kind of thing. So I'll, I'll, I'll make a confession. When we were looking at these, we had different colors, and we were looking. Everybody kind of gets a vote, you know. You get all the guys around, say, "What do you like? What do you like?" Yeah. And at first, when I looked at the chameleon, I thought, "Man, I'm not too cool about that. Yeah. that, that that's kind of funky looking for a guy. I mean, it looks like a fishing lure, you know. This is uh -huh. a gun part. Well, I've got it. When we got these things back, and you see table full of them, and you see, you know, hundreds of them, and you start realizing they're all unique, mm -hmm. and they all have a different look to them. And I found myself literally picking these things up and like looking at them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I quietly and sheepishly selected several of these for my own guns. Yeah. <laughs> I was afraid to admit it after I had given them a little grief. But I actually I, – I, I like this over the gold. I actually do. But yeah. um, And then you see the flame fluting, which is, of course, one of our trademark issues we patented. But we do this in the rifles as well. And I, yeah. I think the, the pistol barrel is pretty hot right now. The match grades in the Creedmoor and Grendel. Those are very, very big movers right now. It seems like people are looking for that extra accuracy out of an AR platform mm -hmm. and we, we see it. And I, I, I don't say that this is just because of our barrels, their match grade, their five R, they have some differences to them, <clears throat> but ultimately the cartridge is a major player as far as the accuracy as well. So we've been seeing very, very good results out of the match grade barrels. Yeah. And I think, you know, with, with the, with the barrels being blingy, I think we look at this as jewelry, right? Like this is jewelry for gun guys. When, yep. when we do the barrel thing. And yes, I because I, I agree with you on the gold. I, didn't, I was like, oh, it's not going to be that big of a deal. But when you see it, it's like, oh, that it's pleasing to the eye. Sometimes sometimes you just have to go for that. <laughs> yep. And, and here's know? one that I did too because I've got my little place I work uh -oh. out here. So I have to admit, I put a little bling on this when I polish oh, this nice. slide Oh, So up. that's mirrored? Okay. Yeah, nice. it's stainless and it's polished. So. Yeah, very nice. I, don't, I, I, I guess I have too much time on my hands. I don't know, but... Really? I doubt that. I doubt that you have a lot of time on your hands. And this, so where are you coming? You're, this is your bunker here, right? This, this is, is my little bat cave. This is my okay. bat cave. My is this cave, where yeah. Britt banishes you to this room? When? Well, you know, if you have to go to the doghouse, it ought to be heated and air-conditioned with a nice fridge. And, yeah, you know, should have all your guns in there. When you go to the dog. That's, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, it's, I, I wanted a place I could, you know, it's funny, I, I don't have a hobby. I just work all the time. And ever since I was little, I said, you know, I, I, I need something to do to relax. So I mm -hmm. picked guns. I don't yeah. know if that was the Perfect. right choice. Perfect. Yeah. But I love it. I, I love yeah. it. I come out here and I can just play and clean. And, and uh, you know, I, I think one of the advantages is we are not driven by Wall Street marketing information and driven by Wall Street or reports or quarterly issues. We really like guns. Mm -hmm. and, and when we make things and use things, I I take things from this I take things from the shop to bring home to be a consumer of that product and I assemble it and I build things and if I don't like what happened, then I go back because that's not right. I, I'm just like you or anybody else. And when I go home in my little place and I want to build something, I don't want issues. I don't want any problems. I want things to do what they're supposed to do. So and and we've got a really good, robust product line, but I think I'm probably our, one of our most critical critics because mm -hmm. I want everything to be perfect. So we try to protect the consumer by just being aware of our products. Yeah. I often tell people that you remind me, you're like a, um, a gun guy version of Tony Stark in my mind. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Cause you're All right, very, I'm giving you two thumbs up. Oh, awesome. Well, you know, it's true. I mean, I think you're a very brilliant guy. I don't know if everyone out there realizes it, but you have another company that you run. Uh, can we talk about the other company at all? Absolutely. Okay. That, that's the one started 40 years ago. Yeah. And it's a family business, just to be super, super clear. Um, you know, I, I, I really go back to the original statement. It, it's it's such a team to, to make any accomplishment that's worthwhile, at least in our scenario. And I'm fortunate to be a part of it. And, and we have just fantastic teammates there and, and managers and talent galore. Very, very hard thing to say today in, in the marketplace, but we have some very talented people. And yes, we, we, we do, like I said, I have a day job. I always tease people, you know, I have a day job and we do a lot of defense work and we do oil and gas, aerospace, automotive and general machining. And uh, we, we do a lot of different things and we do high volume, low, volume. I'll tell you what's cool. We, we have parts on Mars. I, I can tell you that. That's freaking awesome. We, yeah, it was, it was uh, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratories for NASA, 
And mm -hmm. the last Mars lander that went up, we made the the mortar tube is what they call it, a big aluminum piece. And believe it or not, the Martian atmosphere, they shoot a parachute out when it gets into the atmosphere to land the vehicle, the okay. rover on Mars. Mm -hmm. And we we made that mortar tube in the in the um and the sabot that goes inside of it shoots the parachute out. So we, I was up there in Seattle and we were talking to them. They're very nervous and they're behind schedule. And this other guy had messed up. So we, they said, can you make this? And our team had put a plan together and we, we, we made an 880 pound block bar of aluminum into a 28 pound soup bowl, basically. Okay. So we took 860 pounds of material away from it and we had a plan and, and the guy was a little nervous and, you know, finally they said, all right, all right, we feel good. So we're walking in between buildings after about two hours and the guy looks over at me, super smart. And he says, now nah, we're going to fly for six months or nine months. We're going to fly, you know, a billion miles. And I looked at him and said, we've got a problem. <laughs> and he goes, what, what, we have a problem? I said, yeah, your warranty is only three years, 36,000 miles. You're going to need to extend a warranty. <laughs> and you know, you and I laugh with this guy. He looked at me dumbfounded. Seriously. He didn't even like, get it at first. Yeah, get like, that extra protection plan. <laughs> yeah. I said, I'm only joking. And he said, you know, if this thing doesn't work, Mm -hmm. We have a billion dollars makes a puff of dust on the face of Mars. And I said, well, if it does, bring it back. I'll give you your money back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we, we yeah. do have parts on the lander and on the Mars. And on the Mars vehicle. We're doing some more actually right now. But So yeah. that, that's kind of cool. We're very proud of some of the customers and the products we make. Yeah, that's very cool. Do you make anything for uh, defense? I don't know if you could discuss we do. or not. We do. We do. We, we, okay. we play a role, a very minor role. I, I will say this, I, I, without getting into details, I will tell you that after I started when I was 13, I've never served, which is one of my few regrets. But uh, now that we do defense work, everything that we do is to support the warfighter. Mm -hmm. And when we make products that apply to that category, uh, with, without insulting any of my other precious customers, because they're all important, but they're not the same. When it comes to a defense-related product that we manufacture, not only myself, but the whole team, the employees, everybody running it, checking it, whatever it might be, all the people involved in the defense programs, especially today, in today's world, there is a very, very strong humility that you have. And, and the, the pride of being a part of that to support a warfighter is probably the highest and most highest gratification you can have for cutting metal for us, you know, for what we do. And, uh, you know, we think, and, and I've seen airport, I fly a lot. When you see a soldier coming back from combat or a tour or, uh, overseas, and he's walking into the airport and he meets a family with a banner. And you think that the most important thing you can do is make sure that those people do come back walking and to make veterans out of combat soldiers. So any small part that our company can play is probably the most exciting thing that we do is work. And that is one of the areas that I do focus on quite a bit. My brother, my brother, Barry, who I have to mention, shout out to Barry, my boss, my brother. Oh, okay. Oh, is he, uh, is yep, he yep. everything? Yeah. He's okay. president of the company. I, mm -hmm. You know, I told him that's only because he's older and mom likes him more, but, oh. but he's president. <laughs> so, but I told him too, they never, but you're, you're the, president. you're the beauty. You're the beauty in the brains. Oh man, that's cool. Well, yeah, and I got a better sense of humor too. So that's even three. <laughs> okay. Now but, uh, Barry's yeah. going to, yeah, Barry's yeah. going to get us. He's right. very mechanical though. And he's awesome. I mean, we've been partners for so long and, and, and we're just, we share offices and, and he's just a great, great guy to work with. And then all the people there, but my, my sister, and here's the big shout out, Hank. I got, I, I, I got to get this out. Absolutely. Last week, mm -hmm. about two weeks ago, my mom, who was there from the beginning, who is the backbone and heartbeat of the company turned 95 and she still comes into work several, wow. I won't say all, several days a week. Wow, so 95? We 95. Wow, that's she had awesome. Her 95. That's mom. And uh, yeah. we had a major and a group of people in, and one of them was a major last week. So everybody, we had 22 people, and everybody got to meet mom. And mom was a Red Cross nurse in World War II. So wow. she was a patriot and an American and just the most yeah. wonderful woman. And, the greatest uh, I'm a, generation. I'm a fan, man. I am a fan. So I think my mom's awesome. And when she comes into work, one of the things that she loves the most is when we have any of the military or the defense contractors in and, and they all meet mom and she gets to meet the major or whoever might be there. And uh, that, that is her pay. That, that's her. So she's with all her kids and my nephew, Ryan works in the gun area. He's been there for quite a while now. My boy's 19. He just moved from the gun area to the shop floor. My 
husband has been with us for 35 years. So my brother-in-law, my nephew, my son, my mom, my brother, my sister. Your wife, Britt. Britt works. My, I, yeah. I got to bring her in line. Yeah, don't forget about better. Britt. You might, you might not get I back in the house. <laughs> I, I got I got to tell you a short story. My dear wife, we've been married 27 years, and believe it or not, I still really like her. She's, she's pretty cool. But anyway, awesome. my dear wife. She's, she's, she's pretty cool. So anyway, she says after the kids and stuff, she says, you know, the kids are going to older. I want to, I want to work. Awesome. Where are you going to work? She goes, I want to work at the gun company. I said, okay, awesome. You know, what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to do the books. I said, great. So she started years ago with us and she's, she's a very, very instrumental key part of our company in the firearms group. But she is just tenacious, passionate, and just as, as focused as you can imagine. <clears throat> and, uh, one morning after she had started, and this was years ago when money was very, very tight in that group. And then, you know, we hadn't sold a lot, but man, we were shooting a lot. We had to test, test, test. Mm -hmm. So I get about now, this is a true story, six o'clock in the morning. I'm dead asleep. I get this elbow in the side. I'm like, uh -huh. <laughs> hmm, what? Her face comes right here in front of mine. And she says, do you know how much you spent on ammo last month? <laughs> six o'clock in the morning i said babe babe we gotta have rules we don't talk about accounting before eight it's said, too you early this is not the office line. yeah she said you know what you spent on ammo i said where did that come from so yeah. it's it's a blast i mean it, it's yeah. been awesome and, and well, really mm -hmm. as you know when i get to see lola and you get to see Britt, it's it's fun when we can pick a career a path a profession where we can include uh, you know a special person and, and in this case my wife where we can travel together and go to shows together. And to be honest with you, it is, it's, it's one of the things that really makes uh, participating in the traveling and the sales yeah. of a gun company really exciting. Yeah, it's the most so. beautifulest thing in the world. <laughs> there you go. There you, you go. Know, um, and, that's, and I think our wives, our wives are friends. You know, they get along yes. pretty well. And Lola has asked me about my ammo expenditures lots of times. <laughs> You know, I still um, get it yeah. occasionally, but not at six in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Got to be ground rules. Yeah. Got to be ground rules. I mean, I'm sure I wasn't burning through as much ammo as you guys, but I have gotten that ammo conversation like, okay, you are buying way too much ammo. Oh, yeah. It's a, yeah. Pretty bad. We yeah. See him yeah. He's shooting like. Yeah. Though well, that's Lola saying in the background that you really, you really, really like to shoot because whenever we see you at, at an event, you know, you take the opportunity, you know, you're always there talking to everyone and you're very nice and everything. But the minute you Love get an opportunity, you're in the range shooting. <laughs> right. I, uh, you know, when I was a kid in my office, this is a true story. In my office now, if you can visit, I'll show you in a vault. We have, we have a gun vault in our office. I'll show you my first BB gun I got when I was a kid. Wow. Was it it's, a Red Ryder? No, it was a Daisy plastic stock. Oh, I broke it okay. over a tree. You know, where okay. I'm going through the woods when I'm 10 or six or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still have that gun. And, and I, I literally, when I, when I was younger, my older brother would take me shooting occasionally. I worked, I started when I was 13 to work. So <clears throat> if we went shooting, he had all the guns and he was my older, older brother. He had passed, he passed away in 1984. Matter oh. of fact, Dave, Dave Faxon is the one who started Faxon Machining in 1978. And oh. I was a 13 year old rug rat running around breaking things, crashing machines and breaking drills. So he, when I would do jobs and stuff on the weekends and say, finish those parts and we'll go shoot. I'll shoot trap or skeet or rifles or pistols. Or something. And literally I would work my butt off to get those things done. So we could go up to the rifle range and go shoot something. And it's always been ever since I was young, it's always been like a privilege to get to go shooting. So mm -hmm. I've never had easy access when I was younger to shooting. I never did it myself. I didn't have any guns <clears throat> and I had to go with other people. So when I got to pull a trigger, like when I was a kid in Boy Scouts, we had rifle merit badge. We mm -hmm. got 10 22 bullets and to count them out, 10. <laughs> We'd have to lay prone. And we and the scoutmaster, and that was a few years ago because I'm kind of old now, but the mm -hmm. scoutmasters would bring the bolt action 22s in, iron sight 22s. Mm -hmm. Do you know what, uh, what, what, uh, what models were they? Do you remember? No, but um, when I was that age, they were cool models. They were like yeah. howitzers. You know, <laughs> yeah, that I'm was like shooting up yeah. M60. <laughs> Yeah. And, and we lay down and we get our 10 bullets and we'd shoot 10 and we would get up and somebody else would get in and we would we would have three or four guns for 30 kids. And, you know, so to me, when I was younger, shooting was such a privilege and I didn't get to do near what I wanted to when I was younger. And I guess now, unfortunately, I'm, I'm paying that back now uh, to, mm -hmm. to when I have access to these things. And, and I just I enjoy doing it. And, and I learn 
constantly what our products are doing or not doing or how I like or dislike. And, and mm -hmm. I get my own opinion. So when we hear other people saying, and I say, yeah, I, I saw the same thing. I agree. We need to do something about that. So um, <clears throat> it's really good to be grounded in the products when people give you feedback. Yeah. And I think people, people see that in you when people meet you. I mean, I was just thinking when you were telling that story, uh, we've probably known each other like five years now since you've been, mm -hmm. um, running the company and if you remember years ago actually Bob's one of the few people that knows what my brother anonymous strange looks like he might have forgotten by now which is probably good but he you was had at the NRA show in yes Louisville. yeah there you go <laughs> yeah yeah he loves facts on he was excited that you guys are coming on um you know and yeah, the, the thing is is that he's like this is a gun guy you know, when he's talking to you, I'm sure that's why you remember him. He was talking, he probably gave you like a hundred ideas of what he had, but I was looking at you guys and you guys are just going like, I was like, oh wow, this is like a nerd I remember. fest, a nerd <laughs> fest right now, in effect. <laughs> okay, my, my wife has accused me of that before, so yeah, yeah, nerd talk. But it's a good thing, I think, and people appreciate that and they see, you know, they see the real passion and excitement. And the reason why I say that is that unfortunately, not every company in the, in the gun business or the people behind these companies are like true gun people and have the kind of like passion that you exude and your family exudes when it comes to guns, you know? And I think that's leading us, uh, we, we wanted to, we were saying behind, behind the scenes here before we started, we wanted to talk about the gun industry and what's going on. And I think to me, this is one of the reasons why we have some problems now. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting and, and I'll add something to that, Hank. And I, this is not a criticism. It's kind of an observation. One of the things that I think is people are challenged to manufacture the product that they can conceive. In other words, to make the product is, is a challenge because they haven't had 40 years of machining or they don't have the crew of people around that we're fortunate enough to have. So there's always those two things. You have somebody who could, uh, as a group, and we have a lot of, I mean, of, of the group at work, I'm like the lowest pole on the shooting tadpole there or, or totem pole uh, there's some really good gun guys there that are far better than me but when we look at this and work through it if you come up with an idea being able to uh manifest that into a product you have to be able to see how to make it how to how to, how to complete a product or it never means anything it just is you know just talk or on paper so i think um i gotta turn it down Anyway, um, someone texting. Is that what that is? Not a phone's buzzing. Sorry about oh, that. Anyway, that's okay. One of the things that changes, like one of the things that we do in sounds different like a park printing over there. It, oh, we got that in the house, not out here. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> my boy does that. He's got two downstairs. Yeah. Wow. Um, but but when you look at things, I think one is to try to derive the product. In other words, what makes it better? What makes it different? What do you really want to do? And the other is the challenge of actually making that realistic making that mm -hmm. a true product and one of the things that we do for our customers is we have a group of engineers that does dfm and dm D, uh, dfa input so design for manufacturing design for assembly so we actually for other people independent products we have people in our group that provide that technical input for engineers so you have the guy who says hey i really like this or don't like this as you had mentioned and mm -hmm. then you have the ability to actually make a product and maybe even when you're making it, making it really good, make it not only high quality, but maybe keep the cost down and uh, maybe add some features that the engineer thought he couldn't have. Oh, mm -hmm. I, I can't afford that. It's going to be too much or that, that won't work. Yeah, well, maybe we can do that. Maybe we can mm -hmm. hold that tolerance. Tolerancing is a simple statement everybody would relate to. You know, what's it cost to hold a tight tolerance? Some are expensive, some are not. We know those differences and we can get the consumer a lot of good for a little bit of money. Yeah, I, I, to I totally agree with you. Like there's certain things that I don't understand why in this day and age we, we really can't get them or get good versions of them. And I think it does have a lot to do with what you're saying. Um, some people can't actually, they don't know how to manufacture what, what they can conceive or other people are conceiving in, in, a, you know, in a way that's marketable, that's resellable, where people buy it and buy it again and it's a good quality product. Um, like, I don't know why we're not seeing more side charging, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I wanna see side charging in a lot of things. Like these nine millimeter um, AR-15 style platform guns that people are building, I'd like to see more side charging in that, you know? Yeah. Now we, we didn't mess with the AR platform yet. I don't know if we, have, we don't have plans at the moment, but what we did, we said, look, I did not like the rear charging handle just from its, its, its location on the rifle. I think mm -hmm. it's awkward. So yeah. if you notice the AR, it is forward. It's not a reciprocating on a bolt carrier. It's a forward. And uh, 
uh, and it's non-reciprocating as well. Spring return yeah. ambidextrous. Yeah, I don't but, like coming, you know, because you have to come up off of what you're doing and, and get back to go here back. There. Or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's in the wrong spot. But what happened was we found a lot of headwind by deviating from the manual of arms, having a forward charging handle. A lot of people say everything else is the same on the lower, the manual of arms, except for the charging handle. And because of muscle memory, a lot of people go and reach for that. And, and they won't reach up here. So <clears throat> that's one of the headwinds. So when we went into the AR, we said we would stick with the true 100% manual of arms because we took a lot of flack for that, that position of the charging handle on the A-rack. If you looked at the two side by side and chose one, I believe the forward would have a preference. Absolutely. I would, I would a, prefer that. Yeah. But if you shot a million rounds with this and you're, you're used to it, people have a hesitation for that. Yeah, because it's different. And so. that's what's slowing everything down right now. OK, you know what? Before we get because, you know, there's lots of questions coming in. So I'm going to try to take some of these questions um, in case anyone thinks that we're missing. We're not missing you guys. We're going to try to take these questions right now. If uh, if you have to repost it, repost it. We've got a lot of people in here. I want to remind everyone to click the thumbs up and share this video, of course. OK, let's go into this um, is a 6.5 Creedmoor um, um, Arak in the works. Uh, the Grendel will be Grendel. The Grendel okay. will be the uh, Creedmoor would be the ARAC 31 platform. We made several of them, but we've never finished it for marketplace. So the ARAC will probably be picking up six five Grendel. Grendel. Okay. So why did you guys go um, with the Grendel? Because it fits in the AR 15 style mag well, as opposed oh, to the okay. Creedmoor. The Creedmoor is the 308 platform. Right. So we 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 don't have a 308 platform in the ARAC that we sell. Okay. So the best thing we can do for that will go to the 6.5 Grendel. Okay. It seems like the Creedmoor is becoming uh, more and more popular. That I think people just it, like the very flat popular. shootingness of that. I like them both. I, I'm Now, I will tell you this. When it comes to, like, mechanisms or, you know, the mechanical part of the guns, I think I'm okay. But when it comes to actual ballistics and some of the real details, I am not an educated, you know, memorized gun guy for ballistics and projectiles. But I know when I take them to the range, the Grendels and the Creedmoors perform very well. Yeah. And I can I can outshoot the 308 and the 556 five, personally. Yeah. I, I see a level of different noticeable level of difference in accuracy. Yeah, I only shoot up about 200 yards where I go. Absolutely, that's what I've noticed with Creedmoor as well. I mean, you 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 know you pull the trigger, and even if you're horrible like me, you're, you're quite often going in through the same hole. <laughs> yep, I, I doubt you're that horrible. <laughs> we talked so. about the ammo consumption prior. <laughs> um, okay, so what? So I don't know who asked this question. Whatever happened to the Arak um, Ares hybrid? Ares hybrid. Oh, uh, yeah, the Arak Ares. Um, we we did not put that on the marketplace, <clears throat> and it probably is a mistake. I think that we should have been more aggressive in pursuing that. What and was that? Because I'm I'm wondering what the this Ares. Is. I don't have one here. I've got one at the shop. Okay. The Ares Defense makes a non-pistol grip shotgun style stock for an AR-15. It uses a very unique buffer system in the back. And I think oh, right. Bolt. Okay. Okay. The Ares Defense. They also yes. make the belt-fed version. Uh, really nice guy. I'm trying to think of his name. Yes. Um, Mike I know or something? Yes. Okay. He's really sharp. He's a good guy. He's, he's a good engineer. Yeah. So he's that's sharp. like New York legal and all that stuff. Yes. And, yes. and okay. we have not shelved that permanently. But we went into other commodities. I think now the barrel selections and all the other things, we have over 300 SKUs on our website. So we kind of went down the same path we were doing and proliferated more products. However, we don't make the Ares Defense lower, but we did get some of them and test. And quite honestly, we made a – what we did, we took a fluted barrel, stainless, and it was a 5.56, and we tapered it down and removed the thread. So we had a diminishing flute with a tapered front non-threaded barrel and put it with the Ares defense lower and it makes one sharp looking hunting rifle so you can put a five okay. round mag put whatever caliber you want in it and you can have an a rack up or on an Ares defense lower i i personally wanted to pursue that more and we we work things as a team and that was not chosen as a priority but i will guarantee you we've not killed that okay cool yeah because I, I think there is a market for that I think, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of regulations and things like that coming in and we have to keep, we don't want those regulations. I think we all agree on that. You know, there's already too many laws on the books. It's already complicated enough. We don't want to see more, but, but at the same time, we don't want to prohibit people from being able to defend themselves. You know, and, and not to be too polarized here, but I agree with you 100%. This whole thing is a, is a mess. 
and, and, and people think they can fix things with turning the wrong knobs. It's like turning the light switch to make the room warmer. That's not really the cause and effect. It's a thermostat. So w these things frustrate me immensely. But I will tell you this, industry as a whole, not focused on just us, but industry as a whole has a history being very creative and innovative. And the one thing that yeah. is typical is you'll find private industry more agile and quicker to respond than government. So every time they do this, industry should come up with that. Yeah. And, 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 and we'll always counter whatever they do. There will be options to circumvent legally to provide the product to the customer at the best condition we can, given the rules. But, but industry is agile and creative, and, and that's our advantage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Walter from Safety Harbor Firearms, he's in the chat. Um, I think you met him the last time we saw each other in Vegas. Um, but uh, he's in the chat, and he's reminding us that it's now Fight Light. Fight Light? Okay, yeah, what is company? Fight Light? Ares. Ares Defense is now called oh. Fight Light. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, they got bought? Did no, they, I think they, they changed their name. Maybe there was some, like, name issues. There was too okay. many conflicts, with, perhaps with other um, companies named Ares. Okay. So I think that's what happened. I think they became Fight Light. Awesome. So, Thank you for telling me. I, I didn't yeah. even know that. Yeah, they're still out there. I but this that's a Florida company, so far as I know. So, when when um, when we were dealing with, I believe you're correct. Yeah, um, let me see. And actually, my my brother in New York City, that's what his rifle is. It's from it's a fight light rifle. You know, that's what's New York legal. <laughs> well, you know, so. it's it's awkward because every time I take that, I have it in the vault at work in my office, our office, and and I go to every time I go to grab it, I go to grab the pistol grip that isn't there. <laughs> you know, and, and, and when you get used to it, again, we talked about the charging unit. When you get used to it, it is a very common, if you ever shot ski traps, shotguns, it's mm -hmm. that same feel. And um, I'll be honest with you, it's a slick looking gun. We pull the picatinnies off and uh, put, put some rubber on the side for some grip and mm -hmm. put that tapered stainless barrel. That's a good looking rifle. And, and yeah. I like the lower. I, I think it's good. Yeah, I think that's, you know, good. yeah, with all these laws and things, one of the... I don't want to say it's a good thing, but one of the things that's coming out of it, there's there's lots of solutions to these, and some of them are very elegant and good looking. Um, I think you see that with Caltech; they made a California uh, version of the RDB, and that looks good. Hera Arms has a a, um, a what's also I think a California and some other states legal stock, and it looks good. So, mm -hmm. you, know, you know the other I mean, the other aspect of the of the ARAC because that is the feature <clears throat> we we prefer the ARAC on top of the Aries or the fight light lower mm -hmm. is the forward charging handle actually allows you to not take your hand off the trigger. If you turn the gas off, which are multiple gas setting, you can go low, medium, high, or zero gas. Mm -hmm. You actually shoot the bolt action and you charge it from the front. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, I'll, let me grab one real quick. I'll yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, while Bob's grabbing that, I'm just going to remind you guys, click the thumbs up buttons. Come on, let's get those thumbs up going. Let's get this generated. Don't forget to share this. Okay, sorry with, about that. Uh, on social media. Okay, awesome. So, if, so if I'm a go. lefty, I'll, I'll hold it to the right because I have a charging. Unit. But if you're holding a rifle like this and you turn, turn the gas off, you can shoot it. Yeah. Yeah, you never have to look away. Never take your hand off the control board. Yeah. So, if you're shooting a suppressor, you want to turn the gas off, keep the gas out of your whatever it is, um, quieter. Yeah. We see a little bit of improvement in the. Um, it's arguable. We see improvement in the accuracy by turning the gas off, more consistency. We get a little mm -hmm. higher uh, velocity. So yeah. we, we can. Because you don't necessarily actually, get that recoil, right? Yeah, it, it's pretty nice, especially with a suppressor and no gas. It's like, you know, it's a little better. But that, that, that forward charging handle we were talking about right there, really a much more comfortable charging system. It, it, I prefer it really more over a bolt action which, you know, yeah. I like bolt actions too. But if I yeah. shoot single shot, I'd rather do it with my offhand. Yeah, I really would like to see more of these. Um, have you considered doing a 9 millimeter version? Yes. Um, the, uh, the process that we try to use to get new products is we put everybody in a room once a month. We call it Friday. <laughs> we yeah. have Friday <laughs> ideas, right? So we have Friday. Okay. And uh, we use a pizza and stuff. We sit around, we kind of kick things. But what we do, we found in the early days when we started, we took on too many projects and didn't complete them on time. It was like doing too many things and not having hardcore finish dates, which is just bad practice. So what we did, we agreed. I agree because I think I'm the worst offender. They said uh, they call them rocks. You're only going to carry so many rocks at a time. 
And usually three is about where you want to be. Even in, now Glock barrels could have a bunch of proliferation. Yeah. It would be Glock barrels. So you pick two or three of these rocks and you put hard stop dates to get completion to, and you drive to that. So a lot of the things I'd like to start 10 things at once by nature, we've, we've restricted ourselves and said, start, finish, then start more and finish more. So it doesn't mean they all finish at the same time. They run parallel, not, 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 uh, identically on time and completion dates but we try to limit the number of projects so that we can really hit our, our completion dates and get it to market when we think and that was one of the mature maturations that we saw in the management group of facts and firearms is don't try to do 10 things at once and fail at all do three and finish on time so the nine millimeter the six five grendel for the arac have not made the cut list the other things have so when you look at the carbon fiber hand guards, the lightweight ARs, the pencil barrels, the welded 14 and a half, all the things, the, all the Glock barrels, now we're kind of Smith & Wesson, SIG P320. All yeah, the we, we were getting pistol. some questions about the SIG ones, by the way, so I'm glad you answered that. So there are SIG P320 barrels on the way, right? They're coming. We have already produced and tested everything, and I think they're in production batches now. So okay. and as well as Smith & Wesson. Did yeah, you, they're did you also... Now. Okay, good. Okay. Because yeah. I know, um, you know, a lot, lots of folks are actually switching. Oh, I haven't switched over from Glock, but there's lots of people uh, switching over to the MMP. Mm -hmm. you we're, know. Ma we're making uh, the two styles, the standard and the compact on that. And okay. uh, a little secret might be that we should be providing slides for those as well in both the carry and a cool version. Oh, nice. Yeah, okay. so we'll be looking at the MMP slides, the MMP barrels, the, the SIG P320s. Oh, what? 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 Yeah, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> oh, don't tell but, anyone about this. Don't tell. Nobody heard that, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't want to say dates hey. and times because I get in trouble for that if we're late. But yeah. uh, our 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 branching of products may not include a nine millimeter immediately for like the A rack, and it may not be immediate for the uh, six five Grendel. But I guarantee you, we're always working on multiple products. And right. one of the things is the, the pistol barrels from our standpoint. We really spent a lot of time learning about rifle barrels before we ever sold one, quite honestly. And the pistol barrels have been their own learning curve. And now that we've gotten what we believe to be robust process programming, head gauges, things like that, we've gotten pretty good at making pistol barrels on the floor dimensionally that now we want to proliferate through the other, the other uh, models. Oh, so we'll, okay. we're going to put a whole matrix together. So when you go when you do the um, when you do the the Smith and Wesson and the uh, Sig P320 barrels, uh, they're going to be threaded, right? Um, it'll be the same way we do the Glocks. Okay. It'll be a combination with both. Okay. Yeah, we what, like what we did each 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 version, like the 17s, 19s, 34s. They'll come in various versions. Now, if you noticed, I'm biased towards suppressors, so a lot of these are threaded. But you'll see the standard steel with no fluting. No barrel, no no threads. You'll see threaded. You'll see fluted. You'll see coated. You'll see black. So it ends up about five versions for each platform or or gun that we make the barrel for. So we have about five different versions that we make for each one. Okay. So you said I'm going to take this opportunity. You said you're partial to suppressors. Have you guys ever thought about getting into the suppressor market? I mean, I know this is probably like the worst time ever. Um. Yes. And one of the things that we were talking about it, and, and again, not with the time frame, but I think it's something we should start looking into now so that when we do decide to market one, that we'll have had a tremendous amount of testing involved prior to any marketing release. So we shoot a lot of rounds. We shoot a lot of bullets. I think we should be, be working on those designs now. So that, that might be something that would make one of the rocks that we would pick up. Oh, but, awesome. Uh, and you, and, you know, and I mean, obviously, this is, you know, my two cents that I'm throwing in there. I think if you like to twist things or come out with something that's not uh, super readily available out there, I think the future is integrally suppressed barrels. So when, when it comes to rifles, I, I know that, you know, that's a direction that I'm leaning to myself. I, 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 I. You know, Hank, I'm not real good about this stuff. Gosh, if I had a crystal ball, I'd probably use it for something else anyway. But if I look at these two things, I think prior to any of the uh, Hearing Protection Acts being passed, or things after the Hearing Protection passes, I agree with you 100%. Integrally suppressed barrels are going to be hugely popular because they just want the pain and the difficulty of obtaining them. Okay, so uh, we're touching the, the subject of that. Um, 
what do you think are, are our likelihoods of being able to get some of this legislation through? You know, I don't follow this stuff nearly as well as some of the other people at work. Uh, you know, I spend my time, uh, like this type of time being the day job aspect. But mm -hmm. I, I personally, it, it frustrates me immensely because so many people are just normal, good, red-blooded Americans who like to shoot, deal with the noise and the hearing loss over time mm -hmm. of shooting. And, and the thought of, of not letting legal people have a suppressor blows me away. I, I don't get it. I really don't. I mean, I understand arguments. I just don't sympathize with them. Um, but I do think that eventually it will happen because it should. It should happen. These are good, normal people that are shooting legal firearms. Why should we be enduring the hearing loss and the liabilities? How many times do you hit the range when people shoot and you don't have your earmuffs on? You go, oh, wait a minute, you know, and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, it's to be honest with you, quite honestly, a, a rifle can be very rude by mm -hmm. the nature of its noise in, in environments and shooting and indoors and things like that. Suppressors are just a very, very natural thing that should be out there for people who own firearms, in my opinion. Yeah. So, well, I, I totally I, I'm, agree I'm with optimistic. you on it. Yeah, I totally agree with you on it. And I would say that, you know, maybe in the beginning we had a good chance of it. And I think right now, you know, I know that you don't get like you don't really wade into politics as much. But I think that the environment we have going right now, it's highly unlikely. And, it's, and as we go further down the road, it becomes more and more unlikely. I mean, the whole idea of it coming into effect is pretty much um, it's choked off the suppressor the suppressor industry. And I think it's too bad because before we had these ideas that suppressors were going to come off the NFA, we were moving in this direction regardless. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there were companies that like, I know I spent a lot of time just talking to companies and trying to figure out uh, where they're going in the future. And before this, a lot of these, th there's many companies out there, especially the suppressor companies that already have designs and bills of integrally suppressed barrels for rifles and things like that and then when when the uh when everyone started believing in the dream that suppressors were going to come off the nfa and then went and and so and everyone was like well that's it i'm not buying anything until that happens those companies just shelved all those ideas you know mm -hmm. and um and, and i agree with you that it's completely logical it makes a lot of sense um abroad overseas in europe and places like that you know it's, it's required it's courtesy yeah, it's required, it's courtesy and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, just the environment that we're dealing in, just, there's not a lot of common sense in it. And I think that's unfortunate. So I, the one thing that I've noticed in the past, I, when I feel like a direction is headed one way, I never thought gas prices would be back as low as they are today when some of those high priced years were a few years ago. I would have bet a dollar you'd never see barrel, a barrel of oil under $50. And sure enough, it happened. You know, it was 130 at one time, I think. So every, every time I get focused on saying, saying it can't happen, sometimes I'm surprised. And I think that there's an underlying logic for it. I think that there is some high sensitivity right now to that particular topic. But I don't think it should be sustained. I really don't. And I'm hoping that it'll pass and that it'll turn and that people will get back to the momentum that we had prior to some of these recent events. They're, just, they're not a reason for that decision to be changed. That, that, that motivation should have kept its momentum, I think. Yeah, I think I, think I agree with you that it should have. Unfortunately, there's, people, there's folks out there that demonize it and they say, oh, you know, if people had suppressors, they would do more damage. I mean, suppressors don't make things whisper quiet. You know, in, in the case of having uh, maybe 22 that's, you know, um, subsonic 22, it gets, a, it gets a little bit relatively quiet, but in the other calibers, it's not something that people aren't getting all of a sudden we're not going to hear it, you yeah. know? So I, I think that's what we're fighting up against, but I would like to see the whole situation change and come out. Cause right now everything's in limbo. And I think that's a worse scenario because being in limbo means that people aren't even entertaining developing these things yeah and I, yeah. I i i feel for companies that are based on those products because a lot of times companies are affected by, by something they had nothing to do with mm -hmm. and in this particular case silencer companies people who are invested in that product have been negatively affected for no reason of their own and mm -hmm. uh I, I agree with you i kind of feel for them because i know that that's it's it's negative when something happens to your business you didn't do oil prices go up down whatever mm -hmm. so i feel for them on that and but as far as our our path 
we're going to take a slow and steady. We're not going to try to come banging out of the door in 24 hours with a suppressor or a line of suppressors. But we do barrels. Integrally, integrally suppressed barrels is absolutely intriguing. Um, I'm optimistic that it will come back. I think it was logical. And I think that, you know, that fortunately, in most cases, it's still something that crosses party lines. There are a lot of people on both sides who still believe in the Second Amendment. Thank God. And that believe in firearms. So I, I'm an optimist, if, if you didn't notice. Um, otherwise, <laughs> That's otherwise, good. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be in business for 40 years if I wasn't, let me tell you. No, but, absolutely. Um, I am optimistic about it. And I, I don't put that as a 70, 30, 30, 70 percentage or anything. But I just, uh, I, I feel like I, it should happen. It really should. Okay, cool. So, let's, uh, let's get back to uh, questions and comments here. So Tango, Tango Hunter, who's in the chat, said that you guys have great customer service. He uh, stripped the gas block screw, called Fax on, and the next day they mailed him two, two of those awesome. screws, no questions asked. Good. Yeah, I, yeah, I know that's I, the kind of stuff you like to hear. It, it really is, and I appreciate that because I'm that guy. I drop, lose, and break things all the time. Yeah, me and too. <laughs> yeah, I'm the guy absolutely. needs it. And you know what? I want that. I want to put it together. So I don't want to be waiting. So I'm really glad we, 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 try, you know, companies work off culture, right? They could be uh, highly business oriented bottom line. And, and that's a valid way to run a company. Tick tack and tight. You got one screw, you get one screw, you know, and, 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 and that kind of mentality. The other one is, man, you know, if you're like customer oriented, they said Sam Walton took back tires. He didn't sell. He didn't even sell them, but he took them back because the mm -hmm. customer brought them back. Mm -hmm. And, and I've, I've always preached in our company, and my brother is, is in the same, same, same boat. You know, we got to keep you guys happy out there because you're, you're our lifeblood. You're our customers. And, and, and the day we forget that, we're in trouble. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. We're not perfect, but I love to hear the good reports. Absolutely. So uh, thanks for that uh, comment, Tango Hunter. Okay, so is the 223 Wild – um, the compromise between 223 Remington and 556 NATO. Yes. Uh, again, I don't profess to be an expert, but I'll tell you what I've heard and what I think about it. It is a little tighter chamber than the NATO. NATO was pretty much primarily driven for reliability and shell evacuation, case evacuation. Whereas the 223 just had a little higher pressure curve in the 556 cartridge than you should put in the barrel. So the Wild is a hybrid of those two. And I believe that today with the ammunition, the cleanliness of the powder, et cetera, that most people shoot, 223 Wild is a very good, very good chamber to select. I really do. I, I again, personally, <clears throat> this isn't a, a dot, dot statement. I personally see significant improvement in group size from NATO to Wild. Okay, very cool. Um, and then this comment is from Tactical Toolbox, our friend, Jonathan, a Tactical Toolbox. He says, Faxon is awesome, definitely underrated. Oh, man, that's sweet. Thank you. That's awesome. That's yeah. great. He has a YouTube channel. He makes a lot of, uh, he builds up a lot of Glocks, Polymer 80 stuff. You know, he builds, not this, I mean, this is like an actual, this is an actual Glock here, but he builds them up and uh, he uses your barrels and things like that. So, man, I love to hear it. Yeah. Glad to hear it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, have you, this is just, just thought just popped in my head. Have you guys thought about making your own entire pistols? I know that's been in the meetings probably. <laughs> uh, you know, that that's on the distant distant. I, I think one of the things that's nice is the accessory side and help complement the current companies that are making the pistols and, and kind of complement that and continue to provide a little more option for the platforms that are already popular. If mm -hmm. we were to make a pistol, I would think that we would probably, and, and don't quote me on this, but I would think we would probably have to have some feeling internally that we were doing something perceivably better. And I don't, I personally don't have some huge idea <clears throat> or have heard of an idea that we said, boy, we can make this pistol shoot significantly different. So I think we'll continue accessorizing for a while. And if some, some morning God puts an idea in one of our heads that says, hey, we turn this thing upside down and flip this backwards, it shoots great then we might have a reason to pursue it. But but for now, I think we're going to stick with the slides and barrels. Okay, cool. And DF2DOT says, uh, 224 Valkyrie barrels soon, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. I would have to ask. I do not know of that. Uh, yeah. you know, I know it's not on the radar at the moment. Um, there are some 338 Lapuas coming, some mm -hmm. different things for maybe uh, bolt-action type rifles some things like that. But no, I don't know of that in the near future. But yeah. I will ask them. 
Yeah, absolutely. Because you know what the thing is, it's like there, there's always uh, new exotic rounds coming out and it has to somehow catch on, right? I mean, it's no mm -hmm. sense making it and then maybe a hundred people in the country buy it. Um, you know, you really, t for it to make business sense, this is something that you'd want to do that thousands or tens of thousands of people are interested in. Yeah. Then when there's developmental products or new calibers, you know, we want to stay on the leading edge, not the bleeding edge. Bleeding mm -hmm. edges out there a little too quick, not secure, not 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 established. <clears throat> we would consider that more aggressive, like you said. Yeah. And then once it becomes a leading edge and has has momentum and traction, we would definitely be evaluating various calibers. Okay. We, we, mm -hmm. The nice thing about us, we don't care. I mean, we 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 started out with one, and, and now I don't know how many we have between twists and calibers, but uh, and all the pistol calibers now. It's 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 been. We are anxious to proliferate our offerings. We want to become a point of destination for a website, etc., for our product and brand that you can get mostly what you need from us when it comes to barrels or uppers, be it rifles or pistols. So you know that upper portion we want to provide for you guys. Yeah, and has uh, has the Valkyrie um, has that round really come on your radar? I know it just recently came on my radar, so I've never shot it or anything like that. I um, I don't have any personal knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. um, the guys at work probably have a better opinion than I would. Right, some of the guys yeah. back here. Yeah, I think it really is right now on the bleeding edge, like you said. Okay, so here's another question. What muzzle brakes does Faxon make? This is from uh, TJ Blaze. Um, he says he doesn't see a 300 black brake. Uh, I believe on a 300, we would use the 762 mm -hmm. for the muzzle brake. Um, we have a complete list of them. I think one of the things on the muzzle brakes, I, you know, from a style, we have the flash hiders, the rocket man, I like to call the three prong flash hider, the multiple stage brakes, three stage brakes. We have different caliber sizes and coatings, but the most unique feature of all of our muzzle devices is the muzzlock, which is uh, the muzzlock is a way to get around. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm seeing a message from one of your guys. Um, Pat Murphy, is that one of your dudes? Oh, yeah, Pat. Is, is yeah. him putting here? Yes. Pat, save, Pat, save yeah, Pat. Pat, yeah, Pat Murphy says, tell Bob, his salesman, Pat, says 224 is definitely on our radar. It's on our radar then. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what am I? That's what I get for sales calls and entertaining customers. <laughs> it's a it's a good thing that you know Pat Murphy's uh, watching. <laughs> you know you know what now, I, now what did I say at the beginning of the show? It is a team. It is yeah. a team. Pat is 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 awesome in so many ways. I mean, he uh, he's, he's he's fun to be with. I mean, he's just a good guy. Thank you, Pat, for helping me here because I would hate to tell this gentleman we didn't have it on our radar when we do. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. So now you've got that information. So I'm glad he chimed in. Tactical Toolbox says he's he's uh, he's just glad that Faxon actually manufactures their Glock barrels. Most other companies just outsource it. So, you know, we well, I mean, our pedigree is machining. As a matter of fact, we talked about the the Faxon firearms a while ago, about five, six years ago. Manufacturing was just dead. Offshoring was just rampant. The automotive was down and economic issues were out there. And I used to joke, I said, I couldn't find a purchase order with a flashlight and a magnifying glass. I mean, they just weren't to be had. Mm -hmm. So I, <laughs> I couldn't get business. Mm -hmm. and, and when, when you're just a dumb guy cuts metal, you go, how am I going to keep cutting metal? Because that's what I need to do. And we decided to make products. So that we wanted to make machining hours. We wanted to create products that would keep our people employed. We wanted to keep products that would keep our machines running. So we have always been the person who says, we want to make parts. We're not like an assembler. We're not a retailer. Nothing wrong with those guys. We love them. They're our customers and they're part of our industry. But we're, we're pedigree for metal cutting. So thank you for noticing because – we take a lot of pride in, in what we make. And I can sit here and bore you with tolerances and GD&T and things that we do that are kind of geek talk again. But at the core of it, that's what we do every day. So mm -hmm. we hope that that translates into the gun guys coming up with good ideas and products, say this is what we should make, and the technical people saying this is how we're going to make it consistently. Uh, you know, we're, we're certified with AS9100 for aerospace. TS-16949 for automotive, ISO for the general machining, 14,001 for the environment. We have all kinds of accreditation, special process, and audits. So hopefully what that translates to is consistency. Mm -hmm. all, of, all of our quality systems are constantly audited on 
or to provide consistent product to the consumer. So all that is just a matter of fact in our life for the things that we make. So we didn't have to learn or read about ISO to try to make quality products. It's been our background for decades. Absolutely. Not that we're perfect. Clearly, I want to state, you know, we, you say, all, I love the phrase, strive for perfection, accept excellence. Absolutely. These are mechanical things, but I think that, you know, you're the right guys to get into it. Okay, I've got another uh, comment to read here before we get into any other questions. CDA Buck says, as the new director of sales for Faxon, I am glad I listened, <laughs> listened in to know what Bob has promised. Laugh out loud. <laughs> so okay, that's, that's your new. Um, I know you got. We were we were saying that you got some new people. Yes. So um, CDA Buck. Okay. That's your new. That, that's your new marketing director. Yes, and I think I'm perfectly allowed to say his name's right. Bob George. Okay, there you go. Bob George is a new uh, sales and sales and business development director, I believe. Okay. Director of Sales and Business Development. I'm, my wife is on set here too, so I'm, I'm yeah. getting little pennies thrown at me. Yeah, <laughs> um, that, it'll Keep be honest. <laughs> yeah, she does. That's, that's yeah. a good role for her. But yeah, uh, Bob George is new to organization. He came from a pretty uh, distinguished background of sales and, and and customer relations, and we interviewed quite a bit. And I think that for where our company is now, I told you that. Developing our people is the most important thing we can do to continue the support and the customer service and the quality that we have. Well, one of the areas that we need to make sure we can continue with that is, is this business development so that we can create, keep creating and keep funding our development of new products. So Bob joined us here a few weeks ago, and uh, I don't he might talk more than me. I don't know. We're about even. I, he might actually have a few more words an hour than I do. So between um, that, the two of us, I think we wear everybody out. Yeah. Next up, we should but, have him come on. <laughs> be... Oh, he's awesome. You know what? He's awesome. The more I get to know him, my brother and, 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 and Bob uh, were in the car yesterday for a few hours. They drove down somewhere and back. And I tell you, when he had nothing but great things to say about him. And we, we, uh, we feel very fortunate to have him as part of our team. And I hope that his expectations are met by our team and that what he promises to deliver to the customers, we execute on. So he is one piece of the, one, one link in the chain. But I really like him a lot. He's got a great background. I think he's got a great dis demeanor. One thing that we really want, we, we don't want super sly, flashy uh, kind of a sales thing. We're not gimmicky. We're not tin-plated. It, it, it has to be very sincere. And I believe Bob, is that kind of a person. I think he's going to be very sincere and very upfront and honest with yeah. our customers. And that's what we demand. Yeah. You guys are really growing a culture there, right? It's like a family, you know, it's a family business. Even if, even if folks aren't like blood relatives, you want to have that family culture going on at Faxon. You, you know, it, it really is because if you have to work, but there's nowhere in that job description that says you have to be miserable. I mean, if we're miserable, in a lot of cases, that's our own choice. I, I, I think there's always pressure with work. You have to perform. You've got responsibilities, et cetera. But that being said, past that, it's up to us. Yeah. And personally, I, I like to laugh. I like to be lighthearted. I, I don't like breaking windows and throwing chairs through windows and stuff. And, you know, that's, <laughs> Wait, that's not my it? environment. <laughs> no. Well, it's been, a, it's been a lot of years. I told you that, right? So there's been ups and downs and, and we've done different things. But no, I, I've never thrown a chair I, through I a window. I cannot imagine in my brain you losing it and throwing a chair <laughs> through a window. My brain that, does not compute that. <laughs> uh, that, is, that, is, that is very kind of you. Make sure you don't look at any more emails from Pat. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> he may have <laughs> evidence. <laughs> he may yeah. send a picture to you. No, yeah. it really is. You know, the thing is we all, here, here's the difference in NASCAR. You can rub fenders at 200 miles an hour and there's no impact. There's really no harm. You trade a little paint. If you hit head on, you've got real damage. And in business, if we all have the same goals, if we're going in the same direction, we may trade paint a little bit. We may bump a fender now and then, but we're all headed the same direction. We're all the same goal. So we can hopefully avoid these, these really difficult situations at work. Everybody can get frustrated from time to time. And every once in a while you say, all right, I'm going to give you a little extra room today. I can see you're having a tough day. Can I help you? But when you are all aligned for the same goals and hopefully as a, as a company, there isn't one person in there. And I'm, I'm talking about Pat and Kurt and Bob and, and, and Todd and my nephew, Ryan Barry, all these people, uh, Pat, 
these guys all want to do a good job for you. The bottom line, it doesn't mean they don't mess up here or have a mistake there. It's because that's called being human. But we pick those things up, we fix them, we brush it off and we move on because everybody is going in the same direction. So hopefully we have a very family oriented business. And I, I, I hope that if you had any of our people on and they were talking to you, they would say the same thing. That, that would be my hope. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, you know, it's my belief that if you have a, a big company or as companies get bigger and they're successful, if the employees cannot, you know, really communicate honestly with the people above them and, and even to the point of where they can say, look, this is wrong or we shouldn't do this or let's change directions. If you don't have that, then you get atrophy. You know, that's how big companies die. I, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head. And, and you know, the, I, the, the, the real statement is that good ideas come from everywhere. If, if you were to say, okay, the company has patents or products and you're creative, I would tell you that absolutely by no stretch of the imagination does that ever come from any one person. A lot of times there'll be a genesis of an idea maybe, but that never gets to a product. And I've never seen in my life one person have the total entity from creation of an idea to, to execution of the idea by themselves because <clears> – <throat> No matter how minor or how major, input and openness with a team always makes things better. It always does. Nobody comes – I've never seen anybody come out with the perfect idea day one and move forward with it. Even if it's just tweak this or move this there, everybody – the team can always have input to make things better. And if, one of the things when I told you we work with JPL and we had those people, well, they came, took pictures and stuff when we, de when, when we delivered the part. They, they came out. And I took this young man to lunch. He was a PhD in aerospace engineering, super bright. And I asked him, I said, how in the world do you guys manage coming up with all these ideas and solve such difficult questions? I mean, they're going to Mars and they're landing and they're doing mm -hmm. things. Never been done before. And he said, we have a couple of rules. He said, number one, there's no dumb ideas. I said, good, we feel the same way or I would have been fired years ago. Yeah, amen. Because <laughs> you have to be able to put ideas out because they lead, they can lead. They say, well, that's dumb, but if you did this, it would work. So no idea is dumb. It can be the genesis of the next step. The next thing was, and I love this statement, never try to defy physics. You're never going to defy physics. If you spend the time and energy and you don't try to design something that defies physics, you will be successful. It is only a question of how long or how much you invest in that. Now, you may choose not to spend the time or the money to achieve that goal, but in your mind, you know that these things are achievable. And, and it's okay mm -hmm. to say, I won't, I won't go down that road right now. I'll choose another solution. But I think that openness and creativity in the company, whether it be a very minor issue that truthfully a customer only notices but never sees, they'll see it in performance or they'll see it in accuracy. But they'll never know what you did in the minute details. But even those little sub ideas that are not patentable or newsworthy, all of those ideas, they manifest into the product. And I don't care if that idea comes from anyone in the organization. It's listened to and evaluated. And I told you we have our ideas, you know, where we have people together. And I love whiteboards. I love drawing things. I, I love just letting ideas flow. I love getting people in a room. Um, very creative. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh. I'm getting something in the back. They want to see a close up of my old lady snap on clocks. Oh. <laughs> on the back wall. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah, cool. we could do that. Yeah, um, CDA easy. Buck, by the way, says he's glad to be there and it's a true team at the company. So, okay, let's awesome. see those. Let's, uh, let's sh show some folks some things. Well, I, and, I uh, they're behind the guns there. Can you see Oh, those? yes. They want to see it. Are those clocks? Oh yes, yeah, they are clocks. Yeah, me, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't notice the clocks, Bob. I, I noticed Dumbass. that. I noticed there were some very uh, attractive body shapes going on back there. Okay, I, <laughs> I I've been getting Snap-on tools since I was a kid. When I, you know, the little truck, the truck would come, and I had my little account. I'd pay my ten dollars a week, and these clocks are probably twenty-five years old. Oh wow! Then let's show them. There, it's it's art. Right, hold on. Yeah, I'll, I'll grab one. Maybe thirty-five. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Let's see here. Let's lock Bob in. Oh, that's, this is eight, this is 80s vintage right here. I could tell. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, these, I could these are the, quite old. I could see the thumbnail, Bob, the thumbnail of this video. What's going to be now? <laughs> oh, so, well, it's, it's the best thing you'll probably see on this camera all night. Yeah. Unless my wife decides to come over. I have to say that. Absolutely. That's qualified. Yes, we, we love but, Brit. Brit is awesome. So that's so very I, cool. I, I is that an 80s one? Is that an 80s one? 
It's got to be. I mean, the stuff's starting yeah, to come apart. Yeah, there's no yeah, the daylight. hair, the hair, the lace. Uh, yeah, 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 lace. yeah. Was Victoria's <laughs> Secrets even around in the eighties? I can't remember. No, I think Snap On might have had a jump on him a little. <laughs> yeah, bit I'm telling you. Okay, but so that's a nice one. Yeah. So when you buy a bunch of tools, Snap, snap On always had these cool things you get. So I got a bunch. Is that of the only? Tools. Is that the only one we're getting? We're only getting that one. Well, they're all, they're on a wall. I can grab them. Yeah, there's well, the, yeah, and there and there's guns in. That front was the of best them. one. I'm mean, I'm just gonna tell you that was the best one. Oh, that's so the there you go. One of the bunch. I, I yeah. showed you the best. I now, we'll save the other ones for other times when you come on. Let's get some more uh, questions going here. Okay. Yes. Um, can a 762 by 39 uh, BCG and mag be used with a fax on uh, Grendel? So they want to know if you can use the uh, 762 by 39 bolt carrier group and the mag. No, we have, we, we have a Grendel mag for the – or a, a bolt carrier for the Grendel not the 762 it is different i believe again pat if you're listening you can sign on but it's different i think the grendel is a separate bolt so no i don't believe you use the 762 for the grendel oh, okay if pat if pat's still listening he, yeah yeah and if, you're, if you're there yeah if you're there in the in the chat you can chime in on that and and i will uh, let folks know okay so the next question we have here uh what goes into the uh draco barrels because they are really expensive you guys make draco barrels I don't know about Draco. Yeah, or is that misspelled? Is that a brand? I don't know. Draco. I see D R A C O. Now Lola is a pharmacist, so her handwriting is horrible. Okay, that was the question. <laughs> Lola says she got it. Um, and then here's another question she's handing me on the official sheet of paper. I'm getting okay. So we need to look into that whole thing. I don't know whether or not uh, facts on makes Draco back. Are they talking about no. like a Draco A K? A K. Yeah. Oh. AK. Oh, for an AK barrel? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't. We, we make some AK barrels, but I don't believe it's that one. Oh, okay. So there you go. And we so, do this private label. Yeah. So drilling of the gas port. How does Faxon ensure drilling of the gas port is drilled properly in relation to the barrels, lands, and grooves? So I guess that's good. A, uh, good, good, good issue. Uh, we do not space for the barrels and grooves. We drill off the gas block diameter and the rotation is random. So it is not timed to be inside of a groove or land. Yeah, okay, there you go. I hope that answered the question. Uh, Brian Quick says Draco barrels are made by Falcor Defense. So maybe someone's getting that mixed up. Okay, he and they said that, they're really expensive, right? Yeah. See, we, we don't make really, typically we don't make really expensive barrels. So yeah. that makes sense. I, yeah. I, I didn't know what that was. Yeah. Yeah. See, Falcor, you know, Falcor defense, Faxon defense, you know, we can, we can forgive. We can forgive. Pat Murphy says 762 by 39 and Grendel are different bolts. He means Draco's. That's a different brand. So, so he covered hey. both of those. And we got both those right. That's good. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Pat. See, Pat Murphy, he's on the ball. I'm, you, you know, know what? I'm I hope he's getting guy. a nice Christmas bonus this year. I'm going to take him shooting. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's all that. That's good. Yeah. Now, here, here, here's what's cool about Pat. He just constantly is involved in what's going on in the industry. And I told you before, it really takes a team and, and there's a lot of credit to go around for different people. And Pat has a, a really just a, a great understanding of the industry, just a really good in-depth understanding of the industry. What's hot, what's not. He's a very avid shooter. Um, he'll tell you he shoots better than me. That's probably true. He, he is oh, okay. a pretty good pistol shot. He, he's, he's a pretty good gun guy. And, you know, that's where we get the people together. Todd's really, really in tune. Uh, uh, Pat's really in tune. And, and Kurt is our, our marketing guy. Our marketing guy is awesome with pistols. Um, they all care and, and really love this industry. So I really rely on a lot of them for, or we do, I said my brother and I, we really rely on them for their inputs. They, they really stay tuned with it. Yeah, very good. Um, and then Brian Quick says, um, can the ARAC in 7.62x39 work with the CMMG mutant lower receiver? There is a problem with that. We have modified it. The width at the bottom of the ARAC upper in the 7.62 or 5.56 is too thin to accept the top of the AK magazine, which protrudes higher than the waterline of the lower. So it will not insert in the ARAC upper. The current ARAC design wall thickness where it blends in at the magwell is a little thinner than we would like to modify. But I'll let okay. one little cat out of the bag. There might be an ARAC 2.0 coming. 
Uh -oh. And that what? might, yeah, and it might have a little more room for the mutant adapted AK Mag. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Don't don't tell anybody about that either. No. Yes, you guys just keep that to yourselves. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know when that'll be. It's not. It's not okay. on the near near. But oh, that so that's not getting that's not getting announced at Shot Show or anything like that. Uh, I don't believe so. No. Yeah. No. Okay. We we've got some things we wanna we wanna work on, and we're 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 still in development on that. But but that would be one of the few differences. The 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 ARAC platform has gotten tweaked over the years to be fairly, you know, we're, we're pretty close to what we want, but we, we, we probably will come out with an AREC 2.0 sometime. Yeah. I mean, we'll probably yeah, that's maintain cool. The 1.0. We'll probably maintain the original. Okay, so cool. They, they will have various differences that people may like for both. Okay. Um, okay. Lola's handing me more things. I'll, I'll get to that here in a second. Uh, the Tyvin show, who's uh, a, a very big supporter of what we do here. He's, he wants to know if you guys are going to have a black Friday sale coming up. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So here's one of the things we're going to do next week, Wednesday, we're actually going to have a whole show dedicated to black Friday sales. So if you, I mean, I know you're obviously busy, but if someone on the team, fills us in on that, we will cover facts on Black Friday stuff on the show on Wednesday. Well, you know what's awesome? Two of this absolute crack staff that I'm bragging about have been listening. So mm -hmm. Bob and Pat, I'll bet one of you would love to get some information out and get to Hank. Yeah, so absolutely. So I, I, I think we've got the message already conveyed. We'll make sure we do that for you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to invite everyone that's watching, do tune in the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. We will be here. We'll have a Black Friday show. We've got a bunch of deals going. Um, we, we actually have, we've been working on a deal with uh, Brownells and we have some exclusive Brownells deals coming. Uh, Safety Harbor Firearms is going to have some deals that we're going to be talking about. And of course, we'll be coming to you with some facts on stuff. So... You know, and we invite the, the, you guys in the audience to let us know what are the coolest deals that you guys see out there. So, um, you know, Black Friday coming. And, you know, I mean, we, facts on facts on stuff. That's going to be cool. You might be able to get your hands on a Glock. But I don't know. I don't want to put I don't want to put like force them <laughs> of what they want to put on sale. But, you know, we're going to have a nice sale for Black Friday. I know yeah. Pat and the guys have been working on it, and I think you'll be real pleased with it. Yeah, absolutely. You guys are going to enjoy it. And we will, we'll, we'll reach out to them. And we'll get all that stuff and bring it in. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to go through here. Okay. So Archangel, the Archangel, he wants to know, are 1911 barrels coming soon? They're not on the immediate developmental list, but they are on the mid to long term and they will more than likely be filling in with the platform for pistols. So yes, but I don't have a time frame for you. I think the SIG and the Smith are going to be very near time frame and i would i would say they will be at uh shot we'll be announcing those the 1911s will probably pick some various profiles and styles and i would think that would be a next year issue but i don't have a date or time yeah and adam fry says threaded 1911 barrels is there um i thought there were quite a few companies making 1911 barrels but that might not be true because i know um one of my guys <coughs> babyface p he's been asking me for 1911 barrel for a while so i don't know if there's some kind of <coughs> thing going on with that you know i thought there were quite a few out there but that might not be okay this is a comment bob this is a comment from someone <laughs> so uh brian he says on the suppressor issue bob don't come out with a suppressed muzzle loader marketed as a 50 state legal just to find out it's not so i guess that's a little dig a little dig at silencer co <laughs> Well, I, 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 I promise the one thing that we don't have any in, interest in is something that shoots one time load for five minutes. We, we, we like bang, bang, bang. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Listen, I think in, in, um, in Silencer Co's uh, defense, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I don't really have any vested interest there. But, you know, the thing is, is that it's not their fault that it's not legal in all 50 states. It's the state's fault. Those states aren't adhering to the Second Amendment, and they're not—they're—they're they're denying you guys your Second Amendment rights. So I think that you've got to blame the states for that one, because because it, it technically it should be legal in every state in America. So, you know, if it's not legal in some states, those states it's because those states have opted out. So, 
but yes, it would be awesome if that could shoot more, but then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't fall into the muzzle loader category. <laughs> yeah, we, we, uh, the, the joke is, you know, I have more shells than time. So when we get, when I'll, I'll drive home, it's, it's, it's like having a bar right next to my house. There's a new shooting range that's on my way home. So I'll duck in and, and shoot and I'll, I'll literally shoot anywhere from three to 450 rounds probably and anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes mm -hmm. and just go in there. And the joke is when I bring the guns and them look at it the next day, you know, we'll be doing a test. They'll have to scrape the plastic off the foam that melts from the gun case on the barrel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it always melts in. So I'm always driving home and I think one of these days I'll be going, what, what's that smell? Yeah. Is that burnt? Something burning in the back? But thank <laughs> goodness those are fire retardant cases, I guess, because I haven't had a problem yet. Yeah, I was gonna say, man, you need to you need to invent some special, you know, Bob facts on <laughs> fireproof cases. Yeah. I have melted a few. Yeah. That's all good though. It's all good. So let's show let's show some gunpoint, man. Let's show some guns. What you know, you've got some okay. beautiful guns back there behind you. Well, thank you. I think the uh, folks out there would like to see them. What do you have? Well, I showed you the A-Rack, but I, yeah. I'll, I'll bring some here. This is some Now, is that, is that one green or is that just the light? Yes, it is. It is green. Okay. That it's green. green. Yeah, we, we have different colors. So these are Cerakoted. See the uh, the Magic Act? All the way through, yeah. Yeah, this is the Ambi version. So you can eject a shell right or left hand. This is the monolithic billet aluminum upper we were talking about. And then the charging handle is ambidextrous. It's foldable. It's spring return, so you don't have anything loose. Um, and here's the Picatinny rail that's integral where the barrel slides in and out in two locations. And then the gas adjuster is up here, so you can do three settings and no gas. And, and really, the neat thing about the A-Rack is it'll fit on any AR-15 lower. So you don't have to buy a complete rifle from us. As a matter of fact, about 80% of our sales are upper onlys. Okay. So you get a single barrel, double barrel. So you don't have to buy a new gun if you don't want to buy the whole gun. You just get this delivered to your house without a, the FFL aspect, and mm -hmm. uh, the upper receiver can be bought separately. So that's the A-Rack. Um, I'll show you some stuff that we've been working on. I kind of talked about this before. We have aluminum hand guards, and then we have these carbon fiber hand guards. Yeah, I love these, man. You, these, you've these seen are, them. Yeah. And uh, they've got the M-Lock feature. There's our logo. They're all M-Lock throughout. And, you know, kind of a joke. I said, we've been doing this for 40 years, so we're like these machining guys. Well, machining carbon fiber is a little different. So we partnered with Lancer, and Lancer actually does our carbon fiber for us. It was something that we didn't feel we had enough quality on. They were always itchy and had flared edges. We couldn't get them as good as Lancer yeah. did. I mean, that's so the we, one thing, like like mass producing something like this in carbon fiber, that's a feat of engineering. I mean, it, it probably looks simple to a lot of folks out there, but that's a feat of engineering in, in and of itself. It is. And the other thing, we use, uh, we use Lancer as a partner because I think they're really good people. And they do the assembly of the parts that we manufacture. So we design the interface for the barrel. We use a standard barrel nut with a sleeve. It's a very, very solid, very easy way to attach this. And they do the bonding and the carbon fiber for us. So yeah. sometimes, I, I always say we make a lot of our own parts, but in full disclosure, it's not always all of them. Okay. Uh, it's the ones that we're really good so at. So what price category are we looking at there with those hand guards? I, I think these hand guards, they retail for 340 something, I think. They're all on the website. And then there's various lengths. I think there's three lengths that we offer. Okay. And then we have aluminum handguards as well. I don't have one with me, but we've okay. got the aluminum. Very cool. And, and just for uh, out of curiosity, I think uh, Tyvin's asking us, uh, what does the upper, the Arak upper retail for? It's retail normals is uh, 1199 for the Arak upper in a single barrel. And then we have a two barrel combo, I think for 13 something. I don't remember the prices. I'm sorry. I, I, yeah. uh, it, it, it's money's never been a thing for me as a driver. And I, I, truly don't even know some of these prices yeah. and, and you guys, um, I wish you guys could go yeah and absolutely folks can go look at the website if you if you can't like you know it's f-a-x-o-n on google and then faxon will show up but we do have a link in the description for you to go check it out and they've got uh, prices and things like that there brian quick he was uh he he begs to differ with me when it comes to silencer co <laughs> and their marketing <laughs> team we could argue that forever brian <laughs> You know, they are, first of all, you said marketing team. Never believe everything that the marketing people say. <laughs> Number one. But what he, he also says that Lancer makes some fantastic products, great magazines and stuff like that. So, Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm a big fan of them. I mean, that, that's another thing that's kind of weird about this thing. It'd be great to come out and say, boy, everybody's just terrible but us. Boy, we're the only guy who could sell you a good part. That, wouldn't that be a wonderful world for us? 
but the, the really the truth of it is there's a tremendous amount of good suppliers out there and and i enjoy shooting other people's products as well but it's nice to be able to get up in there and, and at least compete in that top half hopefully and maybe even the top 10 percent with design and execution because when you talk about partners like lancer um, they help us to provide the product we want to give you and it was better for us to find a partnership than it was to try to do it on our own and let you get splinters from yeah. carbon fiber every time right. you rub your hand down. Well, when I, talk to, when I talk to what I think are smart companies and, and uh, people want to know, well, why don't you build this gun or build that gun or build this thing? They often tell me, why should we manufacture something that someone else is making really well? You know, mm -hmm. if there's someone out there that makes a great product, why do we need to get into that business? You know, they make something awesome. Go buy that and we'll make something else that either no one's making or no one's making in an awesome way, right? Mm -hmm. that, ser that serves the, uh, the, the better good, so to speak, you know? And, and that, that was one of the things, you know, we kind of talked about our barrels. I'll, I'll, I'll show you this. This is a 6.5 uh, Creedmoor, and this is a match grade, what we call match grade 5R uh, mm -hmm. Creedmoor. And this Fluted. is a 20 inch, this is a straight flute. If you notice, we, we still provide the standard straight flute option. And then we also have the barrels that have the flame flute, like I showed you on the pistol, that go in and out. Um, the flame flute, really, its benefit is appearance. It has a different reflection of light, and it's actually kind of eye-catching. But from a structural standpoint, and not that this matters, but a straight flute is a linear seam. As the variation of the flame flute, there was really no linear seam down what is basically a pressure vessel. So if it mattered, technically it would be stronger. Technically it is, but they're both so capable that there is no benefit of the other. Technically it's cosmetic, but they both do weight reduction and they both do heat dissipation. So I think we have maybe just a touch more area in the volume of the, or the surface area of the space, but ultimately a straight flute and a flame flute are technically very similar. But I think that the flame flute has a little more eye catching aspect, but we still okay. make match grade barrels with your standard straight flute. So this is your, uh, your typical match grade five R, uh, six five Creedmoor barrel. One of the things that we've done, and this, you know, you talk about industries. I don't know if you can see this, but at the top of here, there are rings. Yes, I see that. Yeah, hold on, let okay. me lock you in. Yeah, there you go. Good. Okay. One of the things that we've done, barrels when you put them into rifles can be uh, mis 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 uh, misidentified. The engraving is perfectly fine, lasered. It's very nice, but it can be covered with hand guards. It can be dark. It could be dirty. So when you look at a rifle at the muzzle, when you see these grooves on the rifle, on all of our barrels, you can tell what it is by what grooves are in it. Oh, okay. So, so that has like, what is it, like two, two grooves two, or something? Two grooves on a 308 platform would be a 6.5 Grendel. Okay. No grooves in a 308 would be a 308. The same way in the 5.56. Five, a 5.56 five, five, barrel has no grooves. A, a 300 blackout has three grooves. A 7.62 has one big groove. So you've got this grooving system that we need to do a better job of communicating and including in some of our brochures and, and, and explaining. Yeah, I never, I never read that. Out. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and what we need to do is we need to start doing a better job of getting that word out because we, we looked at the liabilities of having different barrels and you know, putting the wrong ammunition, the wrong gun at the wrong time can be very detrimental. So, especially mm -hmm. in the five, five, six, three hundred blackout. Matter of fact, I think you you, you may yes, have seen all I the love, rubber bands. I love, yes, I love these rubber bands you make. Where are the red ones for three hundred blackout? I I don't have any here. This one actually you can tell it's kind of dirty. It must have fallen off one of my magazines here. Yeah. But we use these for identifying the various calibers. You can put it on the rifle and on this on the magazine so that you know you put the right magazine in. And not even reading, but they're color oriented. So. You put red to red, blue to blue, green to green, yellow to yellow. Yeah, I mean, so, that seems like a simple thing, but actually there's a video that I, uh, well, actually that video is not released yet, but there's a video that I'm releasing uh, probably tomorrow of a 300 blackout rifle that I have, and I'm shooting it, and uh, I'm shooting with Walter actually, and I'm showing him those those rubber bands, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it's a really cool thing because especially in 300 blackout, you know, you you, you put that 300 blackout into the wrong gun and it's over. It's not good. It's not good. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I'll tell you a quick story. I was going home one night and I went up in the gun room. I was a little frustrated. I thought I'd dump a few rounds in the, in the tube, you know, and uh, boom, boom, boom. Uh -oh. <laughs> I blew a gun up. L little hiccup there. Somebody had a 300 round in there and I, I used, uh, I, I slammed the carrier forward in rack, drove it home and uh, then it blew up, which was kind of an inadvertent test. Did but you get I, hurt? 
No. As okay. a matter of fact, it turned out to be a fantastic issue because the ARAC held together and the magazine dropped out at the bottom. Okay. The carrier, the carrier split at the bottom. And uh, it was all very – it was very intact and no harm, no foul. It did wipe out a gun. So I told him, I said, you know, we, we've got to do something about this. This, this isn't cool. And they go, well, you're just an idiot. Nobody else is going to do that. I said, I, that's, I am. That's not true. <laughs> I said, I'm John Q. Public. If I can yeah. do it, other people can. And they're like, you're just an idiot. And I said, oh, okay, whatever. So we're at the range not long after we had, we had guns out. And my nephew, uh, I won't use Ryan's name to protect <laughs> Ryan, but I, I won't tell you who it was. Is he, is he Ryan Faxon? <laughs> yeah, he's my nephew. Oh, okay. So yeah, we, let's, not, let's not say his name in here. Yeah, we won't say Ryan. We won't say no. Ryan at all because <laughs> you know, he has to respect his Uncle Bob. I'm older. But anyway, right. <laughs> so Ryan goes shit. He picks up a gun, and they got a magazine. It was in this understanding, and he shot a 300 blackout, and it blew up a gun while he was holding it. Mm-hmm. And I he said, w- "Hey, welcome to the Idiot Club. You're the second member. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the founding member." Well, this is and why I think way back when I met you, you were giving out those red rubber bands to people. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah you so know. we said, you know, just just again, if you look at one of our core philosophies, it's shooter experience, right? nobody's happy coming home with a blown up gun, even though they didn't get hurt and, and the guns stay together. It's a catastrophic event. So nobody wants to lose that value and hurt their product. So we said, we've got to do something about it. So the grooving of the barrels for identification we've always used and the magazine rubber band markers we use just to help people. And some people will say it's stupid. I know my guns. God bless you. It's not for everybody. But I think when you have a lot of guns in a range and you've got confusion going on, I think, there's always that option, something can happen because it happened to us twice. So yeah. we utilize the rubber bands to keep track of things. And again, it's all meant for that shooter experience, right? Everybody wants to be safe. Yeah. That's number I one. I think that's a great idea that you guys have. Um, you know, I hope you're still doing it. it um, and I, and I recommend folks do that. And nowadays you have more and more uh, rounds calibers that can go into similar magazines. So, this, you know, yep. so you really, really want to be careful. Throw you mag- yeah. Don't hurt yourself. And then also don't blow up an expensive rifle, you know, just for the sake of not doing something to identify what you're shooting. Yeah. And some people use colored tape and there's a lot of ways to do it. We just wanted to provide an option because we, we looked at it. And one of the one of the biggest compliments with, with different things we've designed or, or marketed, or I think we have about 12 patents either applied or whatever at this point. But one of the things is when somebody comes up, man, that's a great idea. Why hasn't somebody done that already? That's the biggest compliment you can get. Mm-hmm. I, I take that as a very strong compliment from, for our team that we came up with something that was obvious enough that it should have been done yeah. and, and wasn't. So yeah. we, we get a lot of that with the rubber. Man, why hadn't anybody done that before? It's, I don't know. I guess they didn't blow up two guns and decide to do something different. <laughs> and that's why we need, that's why we need facts on. And also, uh, you know, I commend you for, for even being honest with us and telling us that you, blow, you know, we mess up stuff all the time. You know, I'm one of those dudes. I don't read the instructions of stuff until I break it. <laughs> I, 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 I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I put a garbage disposer in when we were married. I put it in our house and I go, do things like that. And I'd been doing it since I was a kid. And my wife came over. We're newly wed. She said, don't you need to read the instructions? I said, maybe I don't need these instructions. And I literally <laughs> ripped them up. Right. Uh-huh. And uh, a day or two later, she said, that, that sinks backing up. And I said, what? She goes, that, that sinks back. I'm wrong with that other side of the sink. I said, it can't be. So I looked at it. Two days later, I am piecemealing instructions back together on the floor that were in the box. <laughs> and I had to put the instructions. And you know, there's a knockout plug for double sinks. I didn't know that. Oh. So I had to piecemeal the instructions. I never put the plug out. So uh, never, I, I'm guilty yeah. of that too. But, but I had yeah. to put that all back there on the kitchen floor. Yeah. Yeah, I do that all the time. I do that all the time. That's why, like on, on our channel, that's why we have a baby face now. It's not because I build stuff all the time, right? I, I, I love this. I love taking guns apart and putting them back together. My problem is I hate reading the instruction. So I just jump in and start making things and I break stuff. And then that slows everything down. We've got to order new things and then it gets all crazy. So they're like, yeah, you don't need to, um, you don't need to read it. But here's the problem, though. So we have a baby face. Guess who doesn't also doesn't read? <laughs> yeah, none of us. Two I'm dudes guessing. get together. Yeah, what Lola has to then come in sometimes and just like keep tabs on us because neither one of us like when we both get, we get worse when we get together. 
Yeah. Amen. Amen. Right. I mean, yeah. that, that's a common thing. I'm afraid. <laughs> that's like a dude. I thing. Yeah. I think it's like dudes hang out with each other and they just make stuff worse. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little story. We, we have QC rooms. We have two in one in North, one in South building with DC CCMMs. They're, they're computerized measuring machines. They're fairly big mm-hmm. and they move all over by themselves. Anyway, if you know what they are, they could, but they're very sensitive. Right. And I always started when I was younger. I was quality with my background, manufacturing with my brother Barry's background. Well, I would go in and run the CMM, and I was not really totally trained, right? So I went in one day into the CMM room and then one of the QC labs, and my picture was on an eight and a half by eleven piece of paper, <laughs> and What's it, it was <laughs> it was taped on the side of the CMM, and it had a red circle with a line through it with my <laughs> face on it, and and, and our inspectors. I said, listen, Bob, we really, you, you need to not run this anymore. I said, all right, wow. I, I'm off. So I said, you take the picture down and I won't run it. That was our deal. So, wow. Yes. Yes. So perfection does not run in my blood. As a matter of fact, you know, I've gotten so good at making mistakes. I'm, 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 I'm pretty comfortable with it. And, and people is, 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 a, is, a, is a joke that's true. Um, but in reality, I think one of the best ways to create and feel free to move forward it's not fearing failure. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it really is one of the biggest inhibitors. The fear of failure is one of the biggest inhibitors for people to even to promote an idea or to say it to someone. They're afraid right. they'll get ridiculed. Me, I, I just don't care, you know, because it, it's some win, some lose. But uh, I think that fear of failure is probably one of the biggest things holds people back. And thank God not having an ego that says, oh, I could never be wrong. And really being able to laugh at yourself when you make a mistake or when somebody puts your picture on a CMM and not get mad that yeah. you can laugh about those things. I think that's an important thing for creativity. Yeah. I think that's how you discover stuff through failure. Yep. Yeah. So, so I must've discovered a lot of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm always discovering stuff. I'm always staying up until like three, four o'clock in the morning trying to figure out how to put something back together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could tell you stories for days. Lola <laughs> just gets mad. She gives up. She's like, I don't like look at go read instructions somewhere or look at a video on YouTube. And I'm like, no, there's no way in hell I'm letting this thing beat me. <laughs> yeah, this it's a, thing it's a guy thing. Me. Yeah, it won't defeat me. So it's a uh, guy thing. let's uh, let's get a couple more uh, comments or questions in here because uh, we're we're like uh, running out of time. We've got like maybe eight more minutes. Um, Richard Icorn says, I have yet to buy any barrel other than a Faxon barrel. Thank you, Richard. That's a that is flattering. Man, yeah. that, that is awesome. That makes our whole team feel great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a pretty good way to look at it. And, uh, DF2 DOT says this show has rekindled my love for the Arak. <laughs> so there you go. That, that's, that's my baby. The Arak yeah. is my baby. Yeah, I shoot them all, but that's my baby. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the firstborn. <laughs> right, the firstborn. Let me see if there's any other. Um, let's see if there's any other uh, comments or anything uh, going on in here. So, are there any um, are there any other guns or parts or anything like that that we've missed out on? I know you guys are carrying a lot of stuff nowadays. We are. I'm in mean, the hand guards and muzzle brakes. I didn't bring upper receivers. We we started making our own upper receivers for AR-15s and, and lower receivers now. And um, you know, again, the upper receiver. One of the things just to just to fill you in, we decided to tighten the spec for the bore of the upper receiver within the mill spec, but lower. <clears throat> and we grind all. We make all of our own extension how, extensions for our barrels. Mm-hmm. So we raise that to the higher side of the mill spec tolerance. So what that does effectively is between high and low parts, it reduces the amount of gap that you'll get between your barrel extension, your upper receiver. And we validate and hone all of our upper receivers post machining and post deburring so that any deformation and stress relieving occurs to those processes. We validate and remove those at very, very small amounts of metal. We, we so, actually own that bore and then check it with a hardened pin. So, so those middle, I'm seeing, so those are forged. I'm looking at the website. Those are, uh, yeah, forged. Oh, very cool. Okay. Yeah. Do you see the little shell deflector we milled out behind it? We made a void in it. And I, yes, uh, I see that. Yeah. I got a lightweight one here somewhere. Um, yeah. So what is that? What is that? Um, what is that cut out for? Is okay. It- this is a super high technical, way, way, way superior product. I wanted to know if I was at a range, if we made it or not. 
So I put that in there and we, we milled that in there just so that we knew it was one of our operations. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's that not makes, gonna make it shoot. <laughs> that makes sense it won't make so, it shoot any better or anything else but yeah, you know what i can okay. look over hey that's one of ours yeah you know yeah I'm, I'm just gonna are, make up stories for why you guys did that but the real thing is funnier than anything <laughs> that was it we, we just yeah. wanted to know that that was our upper receiver when you're at the range because you really can't tell but the other thing was you know we looked at that upper receiver and we said how can we really make it different and it was very difficult to try to make that different. Um, the interface and in, in, in the forged aspect to try to remain in that cost, uh, cost category. There wasn't a lot you could do with that upper receiver. So what we really looked at was very subtle changes like I talked about, these tolerances, these cutting the tolerances in less than half, um, using the reaming and the hardened bar for the bolt carrier passage, putting the little shell deflector opening. But the main thing was we hoped to just make a very high quality receiver. It's not flashy. It doesn't have a particular feature to speak of. But hopefully what we've done is we make a very, very high quality upper receiver. And you'll never really see one feature that makes it go good. Our goal is that a year, two years, or a day or a month after you buy it and use it, you'll go, you know, I don't know. It's just been a great receiver. It's a good gun. It just runs well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so what we want to do is give the customer the option to say, look, if you don't want to interface, if you do not want to interface a variety of manufacturers' components on the upper receiver, we can provide the bolt the bolt carrier, the upper receiver, the barrel, the handguard, and the muzzle device. Mm -hmm. So we basically have what is going to affect your performance or your accuracy for the upper receiver assembly. We can provide that to you. That's why we'll be coming out with assembled uppers. But we have all those components now. And, and charging handles are a very strong preference. We don't worry too much about that. But yeah. uh, there's a lot of good quality products out there. But yeah, as far it, as the it interface, looks good. Go ahead. As far as the interface, what we do care about is we care about the barrel, we care about the bolt, we care about the upper receiver. Those are very integral pieces that could affect the performance or the, the experience of shooting that weapon. So we wanted to create those products at what we felt was a you know a, a definitely above average, maybe a premium quality level, and that if you put those pieces together, uh, you would enjoy shooting that rifle. For, for example, one of the things we do is we will match serialize or put a number on a barrel and a bolt if you buy them as a pair we will headspace them for you and we'll put a number on we'll laser engrave both components with a number that matches okay i don't want to say serial number it's not mm -hmm. a firearm serial number it's like we'll a parts put a matched number pair, mm -hmm. yes a matched part number on the barrel and the bolt so that when you're at home or you bought the pieces and you don't want to buy headspace gauges or have any fear you can know that we headspace gauge that pair and when you buy those two together, you're not going to have an issue. So, again, it's that fear, experience. When you go to the range, you're going to have a problem. Is it headspace properly? If you buy them both from us as a kit, as a pair, we'll, we'll engrave those for you. So you look at the rubber bands. You look at the marks on the front of the barrels. You look at the attention to detail on the upper receivers. You look at a flame flute or a pencil barrel with really detailed stress relieving, carbon fiber, things like that. All of our products should have one little twitch, one little advantage, one little thing that makes it a little bit notable and I'd, I'd like to use the word better but i'll just say hopefully better right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but when you get them all together what we want to do is take the fear anxiety of fit form function and definitely safety when it comes to the bolt and the barrel so yeah, yeah i think that's that, a, that, go ahead it's just it's just all meant for that user experience right whether it's assembling shooting or 20 years from now shooting yeah, that that's a good idea. Um, and then I see. So this is for the uh, this is AR fifteen. Are you guys doing like a nine millimeter version or right now? Yeah, well, I mean, well, I think you can use. Out, go ahead. Mm -hmm. We're going to be coming out with a fully assembled AR pistol and AR carbine upper. Oh, nice. Okay. Because again, we have the bolt carrier and we have the we have the barrel. Okay. And uh, you know, we use the same upper receiver. And then hand guards, we use aluminum and carbon fiber. I think that gets an aluminum hand guard on that assembly. Oh, okay. And uh, how soon can we see those? Uh, I believe everything will be a shot. Oh, nice. Okay. That's yeah, just, we should you have know a, what's funny? That's just a couple – that's literally weeks away. <laughs> isn't it crazy? It's like we were just there, right? Yeah. I'm yeah, looking forward to it. You know, i I tell you what I really like, and, and I've been really blessed because, uh, you know, when we pray when, – when, when, when we started this company years ago, and I, I like to say this to people – uh, we, I truly prayed for two things for the company to be. One would that 
our products would be safe for the people that use them because you're making a small bomb that's detonated next to your face. Mm -hmm. You just expect it to behave in a certain manner. So I prayed heavily for the products to be safe for the people that use them. The second thing that I truly prayed for was fellowship that I'm not a golfer. I like to shoot. I love to shoot with people. And, and, and I've got, if we have time, I've got a story I want to tell you. About Absolutely, man. We have all the time that you, that you need. This is awesome conversation. So, well, th- this is something that just happened last night and it's very personal. I want to share it. It's just so cool. But I prayed for fellowship that, that guns would be a means of people coming together and fathers and sons and grandfathers. And it, it, everybody knows the stories. Everybody has shared that. And kids will talk about, adults will talk about when they were a child and now their memories are it's fantastic. So we wanted to be fellowship and, and, when you go to the SHOT Show is kind of why I went down this road, meeting the people that are in tune in our industry, uh, and especially NRA. I really love NRA Show because you find the end consumer there that reach, they reach in their pocket and they spend hard-earned money to buy your product, mm-hmm. and then they come see you. And when you get that feedback, like some of the very, very kind uh, comments that we had tonight, it's very gratifying to know that your consumer is happy with what they bought. And when you meet them eye to eye or they come to buy something they saw the year before, it just is a very warm feeling. It makes you feel great. So the, the fellowship is what I was talking about. The people in this industry, they're, they're red-blooded Americans. I mean, you, you meet such patriotic people. You'll meet a lot of military, uh, retired military or active. You just meet a great class of people, in my opinion. So mm-hmm. I love going to the shows and meeting the people. But I got to tell you this story last night, and, and I shared a little bit of this before. My my sister, Beth, who works at the company as well, I told you the whole family thing. Well, she had a friend of hers. She has a friend of hers who has a son, and he was diagnosed with leukemia when he was 14. And I, don't, I didn't know this young man until last night. And he battled that for three and a half years, and he and took his last – Yeah. It was the, – the, the mom gave a, a, spe- a speech and was talking but um, last night. So she reached out to my sister and said, hey, do you know anywhere – that we could get a lane and shoot a gun at these pill bottles. And this young man was 14. He's 17 and a half now, just a fine young man. And his goal was to blow away cancer. Wow. And he wanted to take the pill bottles and he wanted to shoot them with a gun. <clears throat> so the thing, I, and as soon as I heard it, I said, I'm in, I'm in, uh, that's it. Where and when I don't care, I'm in. So it happened to be last night. So the, we went to Premier Gun Range. It's a fantastic group with some really generous people who donated a complete bay. We had it all by ourselves to have the whole family in there. They had grandparents and sisters, and I mean, it was just phenomenal, right? So the mom spoke first, and then we went in to shoot. And I had just met these people last night, and it, it just really touched my heart. We went in, and this young man, we had this big poster, and we, we made targets that said, take aim at cancer. And we had these different things. And so we, we, we worked him through pistols and rifles. And I took a 9 mil full auto and a, and a 5.56 full auto. <clears throat> and it was this young man's night. He had fought three and a half years for this. Mm-hmm. And, uh, just as healthy as could be, looking great. And he started shooting. So we put his targets up. And he shot. I, we figured somewhere around 700 to 750 rounds in a <laughs> Nice, nice. <laughs> and we had people loading magazines. <laughs> and we were handing him. He would go to the pistol lane, then he would go to the rifle lane, then he would shoot full autos. And for one hour, he just literally rotated and shot guns. Well, here was the neat part about it. That was that, that touched my heart. But here was the really cool part. His grandmother was a little, uh, was a little older lady, you know, super sweet. And I said, would you, and the mom shot the targets. You know, we had them all out there shooting the bad uh, medicine balls. And uh, the grandma said, she said, I don't think I can pull the trigger. Her hands were kind of a little, you know, and, and I said, you know what? I think you can. I said, do you want to shoot those? She said, I do. And so she made me look tall and I'm not a tall guy. So I took her mm-hmm. up there and I helped her hold this nine millimeter Glock. And we had about eight, I don't know, 12 or 18 rounds in it. And we were sitting there and I was helping her and, and I was pulling the trigger for her and she was shooting these bottles and she turned around and we stopped and she turned and looked at this guy by him and says, I hate cancer. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and I said, you know, that prayer five, six years ago for fellowship, I literally, and it just happened to me. It was, a, it was an amazing night for me. I, I was privileged to be there with them, but it was heart wrenching. And I thought, those firearms brought those people together for such a positive cause. And that he mm-hmm. championed a battle for three and a half years to get to where he is. And that was his dream. And, and to be able to be a part of it last night and to use firearms in a way that people don't talk about. People don't think about the fellowship that guns bring about. You and I have met over firearms. 
mm-hmm. and uh, you know, and I mean, so many other people. So anyway, I'm not sorry to. to no, absolutely no. It's, I think cool it's a stuff. great story, man. I think uh, you know, I say amen to that. You know, um, I totally agree with you. And and sometimes it takes uh, a while for a prayer or a dream, you know, vision to not not to come true, but for the sign that you get that says to you, hey, you know, you got there. You know what I mean? It well, takes time to come through, come through, but it's worth it. You know, so often those are the times that are the most valuable ones that we remember over all the suffering and the hard work and everything else. I'll tell you what, it put perspective. So, you know, you're a little late on a party, a little over budget, you got a little challenge, you got to work a little late. And I looked at that young man and I thought, you know what, I don't have anything to complain about. He fought, he, he has fought a three and a half year fight to get to where he is. And I was so proud of him. I just met him last night. Mm-hmm. And it was just a privilege. So anyway, just I, I look at firearms and I've always used them as, you know, like I said, I've always enjoyed shooting and I love going with different people. And we've spent so much fun time shooting and being around what I consider to be nice, awesome, wholesome people. And I, that's the way I view firearms. So when I see stupid things on TV that idiots did, I really don't even associate yeah. them with firearms. Because that's not well. that's not who we are. Like those aren't real gun guys and that's not who we are. Um, not at all. And for anyone that's looking at this, that um, if you want to know, this is 100%, maybe, you know, 200% Bob. This is the essence of who he is. And it's why I like you. That's why I like Britt and and, uh, the entire company, man. Um, I appreciate that, Hank. And, you know, know, I I remember when we first met and we were peddling our goods and Nobody knew our name, and they're going, "Who are you? What are you doing here?" And same thing you, with me. <laughs> you took the t- well. You took the time to stop by, and you were really gracious. You were very gracious, and uh, I, I remember we had our picture taken together in the aisle way. We, we were wow. holding guns, and I, and yeah. I said, you know, that that's the issue. That that's what I think the firearms industry brings, and and the people that we meet. So. I think it's an awesome uh, group to be a part of. Like I said, I, I, I appreciate our defense work more than I can ever show or say. Uh, it's just a privilege to do that. But the firearms, I'll tell you, and, and really most of them, I, I meet so many military or ex, retired military folks in the firearms group. And to me, my hat is off to them. I couldn't appreciate their service more. Yeah, so. absolutely. You know, amen to that. Uh, let me let me read a couple of things because I know I know that Britt is waiting to jump in the hot tub with you. That, that, can... that is in order. That is in order. Yeah. It's Friday night. It's in order. We're going to be. Out yes. Of- yes, absolutely. I don't want to keep I don't want to keep any time from the hot tub, but I do want to get <laughs> I do want to get a few things. Hey, this, in. this place doesn't close. We're good. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I know that there's quite a few folks asking whether or not you guys are going to do something in 10 millimeter. Do you want to hit that real quick? And that'll be the last uh, actual question. I'll make some comments after that. Not on the near radar radar, but not out of the question. Yeah, we will okay. be expanding. We will be expanding. Absolutely. There you go. Um, the Ar- Archangel um, made this comment here, but there's quite a few other folks in the chat that said this, but I'm going to read this from the Archangel. It says, thank you, Bob, for coming on the show. He's an icon in the barrel business, and uh, you have the Strangeaholic stamp of approval. So there you go. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, they're asking that you please come back on again. And absolutely, we would love to have you guys back on anytime. Um, if you guys are launching a product or something like that and, you, and you'd like to uh, you know, get it out there to the public, please let us know. We'll be happy to make time for you guys to come back on again. It's been awesome. Sounds great. Sounds yeah. great. Well, I, yeah, I want to thank you. I appreciate this. You know, being able to talk to you and, and spend some time with, with, with the audience and cover things that we both really enjoy, firearms, and to have the discussion – I tell you, the time went by for me. So I, I hope I didn't bore anybody, but I enjoyed it, and I appreciate your time. No, absolutely not. I mean, uh, I'm looking up, and I'm like, what, two hours already? How do we do that? <laughs> so it's, it's been great. Um, w- were there any things you wanted to point people to, uh, like website, uh, social media stuff? I know this is not your wheelhouse. <laughs> You, you know, if, if you're interested in our products, you want to see our growth or what our product lines go to, check us out at factsandfirearms.com. Um, we're not a hard selling peddling kind of a company, but we really want you to share what we're doing and hopefully some of it will meet some of your needs and, and you'll be happy if you buy it. So factsandfirearms.com, just check it out and keep checking back because our products should be continuously expanding. We are not a static company. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. So uh, my final words uh, before I end the, the broadcast here, Bob, when I end it, you and I will still be on. So we'll have a little 
conversation in the uh, background here. Um, Sounds I great. Want, I want to thank everyone that came on and asked all the questions. Everyone who you know shared the video gave up gave us the thumbs up and all that. It's been great. Lots of uh, folks in the chat. I can still see the chat just scrolling up. So thanks to everyone there. We want to thank the people that support us on Patreon. It's Patreon slash. Hank Strange, and uh, we appreciate your support. Believe it or not, as soon as we put up one of these things, YouTube automatically demonetizes it. And then, you know, in the first couple of days, which is where we would make the most revenue from advertising, we got to fight for that and try to get it back. So we appreciate everyone that supports us on Patreon. Also, we do have some sponsors. That would be Rand CLP, Andrew's Custom Leather, Safety Harbor Firearms, and of course, Big Daddy Guns. That's how we get to... Uh, you know, that's how we, we get this space here in the internet, the broadband and all that kind of stuff. So you want to thank those folks. All right, guys, we will see you next week. And don't forget that next Wednesday we're going to do the Black Friday sales show. So look forward to that. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Be safe on, on behalf of me and uh, this gentleman here and everyone else at Faxon. See you guys. Peace out. Thank you.